deserve better, and we must do better for both children and for women in this country and across the globe. Lila Rose, we have to end there. I thank you very much indeed for joining me thank on you. Hard Talk. Thank you. That was Hard Talk. I'm Jeff Goods. You're listening to CBC Radio 1. Have a great day. Good morning, Manitoba. I'm Marcy Marcusa. This is Information Radio, and you're on CBC. 89.3 FM, 990 AM on the app on YouTube. And thanks for joining us. Three minutes to 6 o'clock. Morning show's on until 8.37 if you need us in traffic. Always remind you early, 788-3093. But I think we're going to have a pretty straight-ahead day here uh, in Manitoba. For Winnipeg, uh, a mix of sun and cloud today and a high of 5 degrees. Pretty similar to yesterday. Maybe a little more cloud. Good morning and welcome back to uh, Corey Funk. Good morning, Corey. Corey is uh, our show director and will be on air covering the commute. And good morning and welcome back to Mr. Abby Adeyemi behind the controls. Hey, Abby. Abby is our technical producer on the program and also will be on the air covering the weather. And good morning to Brad Lillies, who's once again back behind our YouTube controls. So if you had a long, long weekend, uh, then hopefully uh, you're going to be back into it this morning as, uh, you know, kids are back off spring break. And uh, welcome to your Tuesday, April 2nd. Let's get to Heather Wells right now and find out what is happening. It is not just any Tuesday. She's here with our news headlines. Good morning. Well, Manitoba's NDP government presents its first budget today. Christopher Adams, political science professor at the University of Manitoba, is expecting big changes from the NDP compared to the previous conservative government, especially, he says, when it comes to health care. And Adams also says the NDP are not likely to balance this year's budget. A Winnipeg man who escaped war in Syria as a child is speaking out as conflict rages in other parts of the world. Ibrahim Sarhan has made it his mission to speak out on behalf of war-affected children. We'll hear from him coming up in our next news locally at 6.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. I sat down with him, in fact, yesterday at great length. And so we have a full interview with him, a feature interview on our program this morning. And uh, there's uh, also a very pivotal moment that involves a video. So if you want to go online and read the piece he wrote, cbc.ca slash Manitoba uh, is where you can see the video uh, of him as a child of war. Uh, in Winnipeg, I just want to uh, circle back here. I was talking about the forecast. I wasn't talking current conditions, though. So right now we're clear. It's one degree. There's light snow falling in Thompson, where it's minus three. And over in Brandon, it's mainly clear, and it's minus one. Now, in addition to hearing from Ibrahim, in the first hour of the show, we're going to tee up the budget. What could be in this for you? Uh, stay tuned. We will walk through that. And uh, this afternoon, Up to Speed is live at the Ledge. Today on Q. What is this place? You're looking pretty good in there. I'm Talia Schlanger sitting in for Tom Power. The new film Love Lies Bleeding has been rightfully described as an erotic thriller on steroids. I'll talk to one of the stars, Katie O'Brien, about how her real life experience as a bodybuilder informed her role Jackie. Q. This morning at 10, 1030 in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. World leaders are reacting with outrage to reports seven aid workers have been killed while delivering food in central Gaza. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. This is a human tragedy that should never have occurred that is completely unacceptable. The aid workers were with the group World Central Kitchen. It says they were killed by an Israeli airstrike overnight. A dual Canada-U.S. citizen is among the dead. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, more than 32,900 Palestinians have been killed. Israel's military says it is investigating this incident. Anna Cunningham has the latest. World Central Kitchen says the foreign nationals were working in Gaza in the central area of Dar al Bella when their convoy was hit. Images from the scene show the charity's logo clearly visible on a vehicle. This is an organization that's been, you know, working on building a port right on the front lines. Matthew Hollingworth is the World Food Programme Country Director for Palestine. He was in Gaza last week and knew those who died. They were bringing food assistance from that pier that they've built to their warehouses in, in Derabella and then they were coming back in the evening from that warehouse to their base in Rafah. 
It's understood that the charity had shared its coordinates with the Israeli military. We have yet another immense tragedy. James Elder is from the UN's Children's Fund, UNICEF. This has been one of the most dangerous places in living memory to operate. Gaza's breaking too many bleak records. The UN has warned that Gaza is on the brink of a man-made famine. World Central Kitchen CEO said this was an unforgivable attack. It's now pausing operations in Gaza, as is a second NGO. They had been supplying some two million meals a week. Anna Cunningham for CBC News, London. Iran is accusing Israel of launching airstrikes at its embassy in Syria yesterday and it's promising to retaliate. Hossein Akbari is the Iranian ambassador to Syria. He says Israel has violated international law. Seven military commanders were reportedly killed in the attack. This is the first time Iran's embassy compound in Syria has been hit. Israel's military has not commented on this incident. President Joe Biden's military support for Israel could be a factor in the upcoming U.S. election. Both he and Donald Trump are expected to win their respective primary votes tonight in Wisconsin. But some Democrats say they will mark their ballot uninstructed in protest of Biden's continued support for Israel. The CBC's Richard Madden joins me now from Washington. And Richard, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is a movement by younger progressives who are pushing voters to mark uninstructed. That's Wisconsin's version of voting uncommitted on the ballot. It's a way to protest President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Their goal is to register a symbolic 20,000 votes, which is roughly Biden's margin of victory over Donald Trump in this critical swing state in the last election. Now, organizers say they want to send a message to force the president to call for a ceasefire and stop sending weapons to the Israelis. This is an issue that's divided the party and threatens Biden's coalition that helped him in the White House in 2020. Thousands of voters in about a dozen other states have chosen similar options against him, which is raising concerns among Democrats if these voters they typically count on choose to stay at home in November that could cost Biden the presidency. Now, the Biden campaign issued a statement saying the president shares their goal for an end to the violence, and he's working tirelessly to that end. Now, President Biden is considering a new weapons transfer to Israel. What impact could this have with voters? Yeah, this could further divide his party, especially left-leaning progressive voters. Multiple reports say the Biden administration is about to greenlight an extra $18 billion aid package to Israel. Now, Congress has to approve the deal, which will likely cause more outrage from the progressive wing in his party, who've been calling for restricting military aid to Israel until it lets in more humanitarian aid into Gaza. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. Police in Finland say a 12-year-old suspect is in custody after a fatal school shooting. They say the child opened fire on an elementary school this morning. One student died. Two others were injured. The victims were also 12 years old. Police say the shooter had a handgun that was registered to a close relative. In Finland, police cannot hold suspects who are younger than 15. The suspected shooter will be handed over to Child Protective Services. Former directors from conservative, liberal and NDP campaigns are scheduled to testify in Ottawa today. They'll appear together in a panel at the public inquiry into foreign interference. The CBC's Janice McGregor is following along from our Parliamentary Bureau. And Janice, what will you be listening for this morning? Marcia, an early theme emerging here is whether officials took the threat of foreign interference seriously enough and communicated it clearly enough to those who needed to hear it, like this first panel of witnesses this morning. People who ran the 2021 election campaigns for the Liberal, Conservative and New Democratic parties, Waleed Soliman, the co-chair for the Conservatives, was outspoken about how he does not think this system worked. Intelligence officials didn't share enough specifics about what they knew in specific rights. Writings. They only made general statements, he said, about how there wasn't enough evidence to suggest there's anything to worry about. Conservatives themselves, though, were worried, specifically about false information they realized was circulating on Chinese-language social media that they now think moved a number of votes in specific writings. But the evidence presented at the inquiry Thursday suggested that Canada's elections watchdog didn't think the application of false information fell under its mandate. The inquiry will also hear from several 
politicians accused of participating in China-backed meddling efforts this afternoon. What might we hear there? Yes, and these are politicians who have taken legal action, actually, to try and defend their reputations after media reports suggested they had inappropriately close ties to consulate officials acting on behalf of the government in Beijing. Former Provincial Cabinet Minister Michael Chan, who's now the Deputy Mayor of Markham, he featured in a number of media reports quoting secret intelligence sources. And the final two witnesses this afternoon, now independent MP Han Dong, as well as his campaign manager, they're expected to speak directly to the allegations that operatives meddled in a 2019 Liberal nomination meeting. But as we heard last week at the inquiry, nomination meetings aren't inside the mandate of what election officials monitor. All right. Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. Janice McGregor reporting from Ottawa. Lawyers for the oil giant Shell will be before a Dutch court today. They are appealing a landmark ruling from The Hague. In 2021, the International Court ordered Shell to reduce carbon emissions by 45 percent from 2019 levels, and it gave it the deadline of 2030. The ruling also applied to Shell's buyers, and today Shell is arguing companies cannot be held responsible for their clients' emissions. A verdict is expected later this year. The community of Cape Ray, Newfoundland, is banding together to salvage a mysterious shipwreck. The old wooden ship washed up in January. Residents pulled it to shore. Now they need to decide what to do with the wreck. Heather Gillis has that story. Two excavators pulled the Cape Ray shipwreck out of the sea Sunday, struggling to move the heavy, soggy, centuries-old wood. Sean Bath has been trying to save it from slipping back into the Atlantic. It's a relief to me because it was very time-consuming and it was a lot of hard work. And we had so many people looking at us and saying, OK, you guys are not going to get out of the water. It's not going to happen, right? But, I mean, you don't give up on something so important. It emerged seemingly out of nowhere in late January. Archaeologists from the province took samples to determine its age and origin and believe it's from the 1800s, but say it's not historically significant because there are hundreds more from the same era around Newfoundland and Labrador. Those working to save the wreck, like Bath, disagree. I don't know how they can determine it when they don't know how old it is or where it came from or what it was used for. Preserving it is the next challenge. Some experts estimate it will cost millions. Money that Cape Ray, a community of about 300 on Newfoundland's southwest coast, doesn't have, says Ann Osmond. Uh, we're going to have to be looking for funding from government COA grants and stuff to probably build a building around it. Meanwhile, Osmond says the wreck broke moorings on the beach four times during stormy weather, but says it washed back up again on the beach in the same spot leading her to believe the wreck was meant to be in Cape Ray. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report. If you are looking for ways to talk to the little people in your life about the big stories in the world, go to CBC News Kids. It's all there. That is World Report. I'm Marcia Young. Yesterday, we were reading from CBC Kids, actually, as they had five things to understand as uh, Nunavut uh, celebrates becoming a territory. 25 years. The anniversary was yesterday. Good morning, everyone. We're now at Tuesday morning, April 2nd, getting into the month at 6.10 a.m. And I'm Marcy Marcusa with our team here at Information Radio. You're on 89.3, 9.90 a.m. on the app or on YouTube. Good morning to everyone watching this morning. Well, it is Budget Day in Manitoba. We're going to hear from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation this hour. They're raising concerns about increasing amounts of debt in Manitoba. In addition, we're going to hear uh, from a professor in political studies today on uh, on the budget. It is the first for Manitoba's newly elected and government so Chris Adams is going to be on the show this hour and to another topic the wisdom of nurses stories of grit from the front lines that's the title of a new book that comes out in this country today it's written by two nurses we're going to talk to one of them 
So lots coming up. Let's continue to tee up the budget and other stories. Heather Wells is in with our news headlines. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, and this is the very first budget for Wab Canoe and his NDP government. Expect plans to overhaul the way the province collects education taxes in 2025. A spokesperson tells CBC the province in this budget will scrap the 50% provincial property tax rebate next year. The province is also expected to extend the gas tax holiday. Winnipegger Dante Santanangelo says homelessness is the top issue he wants the government to address in today's budget. He says the government should also focus on reducing wait lists in health care. We'll hear more from Winnipeggers coming up in our next local news at 6.30. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, we're going to get into weather and traffic in a moment, but while we're hearing from Winnipeggers, uh, advocates are also calling on Manitoba government to boost rent gear to income housing units ahead of uh, the budget today. And uh, we've been hearing so much about what the challenges are with rent. On my Facebook page, I asked Manitoba renters, what's it been like for you trying to make ends meet? So throughout the morning, we'll share some of those comments that have been coming in, and there are a lot of them. And then we'll see what is in the budget today around housing, but also uh, around rent. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll have uh, some of those comments on. If you want to call us as well, 788-3205, what do you want to see in the budget? Uh, what is something that you're watching for in the budget? It doesn't have to be specific. I know a lot of people think, oh, I don't know the specific numbers. What do you care about? What affects your life? Where could you use a budget break or some help? Uh, is it housing? Uh, is it something else? Seven eight eight three two zero five. All right, it's time to get into our forecast here. Good morning, Abby. Good morning, Marcy. How are you doing today? I'm well. Did you have a nice Easter? I did. It was wonderful, and the weather was also cooperating. Oh, good. Sound. Let's roll Corey in for a second. So I'm just curious if your little guy did any egg hunt or whatever over the weekend. <laughs> we uh, attempted it. He's a year and a half, so he, we we put out eggs, and then we're like, go find them. But he didn't quite understand the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> it was great though. He he still he liked playing with the eggs and opening them. There what was did, little goldfish in there. What did he think the assignment was? Uh, I don't know. Put the uh, eggs in your mouth and then <laughs> dad trying to pull them out. Yeah. Oh, Easter fun with kids. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, way too much chocolate. There's so much sugar in the newsroom. I'm still buzzing from yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Uh, all right, Abby is here to talk forecast. Corey, commute. Uh, who wants to go first, guys? I think let's just start with the wet streets we're seeing. That's going to link with Corey's uh, uh, commutes, definitely. Some wet streets were waking up to this morning in Winnipeg because of the precip 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 precipitation we got overnight. Now, currently in Winnipeg, it's crispy. It's one degrees and uh, partly cloudy. We're trying to see a clearing, but it's still partly cloudy as you start your day. Now, throughout the day, you should anticipate a blend of sunshine and clouds with the clouds gradually taking over the skies as the day unfold. But one thing that is in the forecast that we're seeing today is more of some gusty northwest winds which are going to be kicking in sometime this morning. And put that aside because we'll, get in, we'll be getting to a high of 5 degrees. Now, Marissa, I know uh, Corey was saying, ah, I'm the bearer of bad news when I was talking about uh, the chills that we're going to be getting before Easter. And maybe I can just uh, rub this over you now, Corey. You talked. You talked about. <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't be listening. That you'd be you, sleeping in or you, something. You talked that. about the single digits. Let me bring the double digit for you because Curry was also excited about single digit highs. Look at Wednesday. We're gonna get nine, and then Thursday we're gonna get twelve, and then Friday we're gonna get fourteen. Sunny, sunny. How about that? Boo in your face. See. <laughs> Wow. Did he just say boo in your face? I, I would have known that Abby would hold such a grudge. <laughs> I was listening. I, know, I wouldn't have called him out on air about being the bearer of bad news all the time. That's there awesome. you go. So we have a beautiful day in the city. It's going to be some sunny and cloudy day, and then we'll get a high of five and uh, just the wind. So if you're if you're runner like Corey, definitely it's going to be chilly for you. Just touch your day. Thanks, Abby. You're welcome. Uh, Corey, what, how are you going to follow that? <laughs> I don't know. I know he just took me down a notch. I, I don't know how to how to follow it. I mean, I, I'll, I guess I'll just. I'll just be a professional and I'll just report straight up. <laughs> uh, yeah, my running this morning, I can tell you with that kind of freeze thaw thing, you kind of hit those slippery patches. It's like either a slippery patch or a puddle on those sidewalks right now. So it, it can be a little bit sketchy. Uh, so look out for that. That might be the same case uh, on the roads as well. So maybe give yourself a little space if you're braking because it, uh, it does still get cold overnight. Look out for that. Uh, other than that, sidewalks uh, or uh, highways and roads, things like that do seem to look uh, uh, pretty clear so far but if you see something going on give me a call on the cbc commuter line i'll let folks know what you're seeing 204-788-3093 
right, Manitoba, it's budget day in this province. First NDP budget in eight years since they last held office. How will they uh, affect your life in comparison to past budgets, especially in this time where so many people are struggling with a number of things when it comes to your own household, bottom lines. So the first hour of the show, we're going to set things up. I'd want to mention that we will be live today. Up to speed is live. CBC will be in the rotunda at the legislature this afternoon. Uh, So that is going to be a live show as the budget is uh, delivered. Uh, The Canadian Taxpayers Federation was out front of uh, things yesterday. They were saying the provincial debt clock needs to be thought about, so they brought it to Manitoba. It shows the province's debt in real time. So it arrived at the legislature in advance of the budget today. CTF Prairie Director Gage Hobrick says that Manitoba's debt has now reached $23,000 for every person. And he spoke to reporters about it. Manitobans deserve consistent, balanced budgets. Out of the last, in the last 10 years... The government has only managed to balance the budget two times. That means more debt and more interest payments off the backs of Manitobans. This year, the government's looking to waste $2.2 billion on interest payments on that provincial debt behind me. If that money didn't have to be wasted on interest payments, if the government had made better decisions in the past and spent within their means, that money could have been used to hire over 20,000 nurses or build a couple hospitals. But instead, it's being used for absolutely nothing. And that's why taxpayers are here at the ledge today to call on Premier Wab Kanu and Finance Minister Adrian Sala to balance the budget so that debt can start to go down and they can start to reduce that huge interest payment bill. This government has talked a lot about its commitment to fiscal responsibility and we're looking for them to follow through on that tomorrow and deliver a balanced budget for Manitobans and for taxpayers. How do you think we should do that? Should uh, the Finance Minister and the, the government reimpose the 14 cents per litre uh, gas tax holiday? Should they, that that's on holiday? No, the government should look for, for savings in the spending that they're doing. For years, uh, the government has consistently spent more than they've brought in in tax revenue, even when uh, the gas tax was at 14 cents a litre. So they need to go to the drawing board and look uh, for those more savings to find across the board. Uh, they need to keep that 14 cents per litre gas tax cut in place they need to extend it because just like how inflationary costs are affecting government and everything else they're also affecting families and households and uh, those savings they're getting go a long way to helping families make those ends meet. So you don't see it being uh, as a need for more revenue and increasing taxes on the richest Manitobans you don't think that's a good proposal? I don't think so no because when it, when it comes to that as well when you when you hike those taxes um, it can also mean that uh, someone can pick up their family van and just move over to Regina. Manitobans are also already paying much higher taxes than uh, similar families in Saskatchewan or Alberta. So they're already under that kind of pressure. So putting that up even higher uh, makes it difficult for families to make ends meet. So the government needs to look inward uh, and find their own way to balance that budget. So this is our, uh, our debt clock and showing the Manitoba provincial debt as it would have been um, last night because uh, now we're being in a, a new fiscal year. It's talking about that $23,000 number. That's the share that would have to be paid back by every single Manitoban of the debt that's rising up. And we decided to bring it to the ledge today to see if uh, you know any politicians are going in to prepare for the budget and might have uh, a change of heart or some sort of inspiration. What would you hope to see in the tomorrow's budget? Um, you know, the best case scenario would be a balanced budget uh, from the government so that debt can start to come down, they can start to stop losing so much money on interest payments. But we understand the, the fiscal situation the province is in right now, so the government comes forward uh, with reduced deficit and a plan to balance. That's much better than nothing because if the government doesn't come forward with that plan to balance, they've been talking with this rhetoric about fiscal responsibility, it's become much more difficult for taxpayers to believe them in the future if they don't have that plan. And do you have any thoughts uh, today being April 1st and the uh, federal carbon tax going up? Well, obviously, uh, we aren't a huge fan of the federal carbon tax going up. You know, right now it's going to be 17 cents per liter of gasoline. You know, I just got into Winnipeg last night and I saw everybody lined up at every manner of gas station trying to get that last little chunk of savings in before before the day is up. And uh, it's unfortunate that the federal government decided to hike that tax again. And um, we hope they scrap it in the future. And so the, your share, 23000 that's what every Manitoban would have to pay? Yeah, so that's what every Manitoban would have to pay. It's not every taxpayer, it's not every adult, it's every man, woman, and child in Manitoba. As of? As of the last stats can quarterly population update. How do you hope to benefit from this gimmick? Like, it's, 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 it's a gimmick, right? Yeah. What, what is your bring this truck around? Well, it's a good way to spark the conversation. You know, sometimes uh, even the most important math can look very boring and hard to get the message across. So when we have it on the side 
of a big truck like this, you know, it makes it a little bit more interesting for people to see. And, uh, you know, you can see it walking by, you can see it walking uh, into the ledge. It kind of just draws attention to something that we think is really, really important and often gets overlooked. Gage Hobrick, a Prairie Director with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. The gimmick they're referring to is that provincial deck clock that they, uh, they, they drag around. They were at the ledge yesterday. He was speaking there with reporters, but raising concerns uh, about the budget. The budget, of course, comes out today, this afternoon. We'll have a lot of analysis throughout this morning's program. You can go online if you want to see what we already understand. We'll be, uh, we're expecting to be in the budget this afternoon. But I want to mention that we're on location, and uh, that's today and tomorrow. So CBC is going to be out in community this afternoon covering the budget. Up to Speed is live from the Rotunda at the legislature this afternoon. So that is this afternoon. Tomorrow, we are live out. I uh, just wanted to pick a busy morning location. So if you want to weigh in on the budget, and if you go to... Uh, Altia Active Fitness Center in Winnipeg out in um, Bridgewater. So this is in the Waverly West overall neighborhood, but specifically in Bridgewater. Uh, maybe uh, we will see you there if you're a member there. And I know we do have the Premier confirmed for our program tomorrow uh, as we uh, await the budget. We'll see what's in it today and a lot of analysis coming up in the next 24 hours. There are stories you just can't stop thinking about. They take you somewhere. They introduce you to someone. They share something new with you. Lift off. Those are the stories you want to share with your friends. And CBC's award-winning documentary team is bringing them to you every week on Storylines. Storylines, new this season on CBC Radio 1 and always on demand on the CBC Listen app. Well, with all the talk about property taxes, education school taxes, uh, renters, the carbon tax, uh, we have not yet mentioned a health care. We'll be seeing what's in the budget around health care and the NDP's promises to uh, hire more nurses. Next on the show, there's a new book out about nursing and the reality in this country. Uh, Canadians depend on nurses so much when they wind up a course in a hospital or a clinic. Uh, they are frontline workers, but they're also often underpaid all across Canada, and many feel undervalued. Now, those perspectives are captured in a book. Two nurses wanted to describe the highs and lows of their profession, a profession they regard as a vocation. Their book is called The Wisdom of Nurses, Stories of Grit from the Front Lines, and Amy Varley is uh, one of the authors. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Tell me more about, you know, why you wanted, from your personal perspective as a nurse, to write this book. Well, one of the, the things that we had done and uh, had asked some of our friends and some of our colleagues, to, we, we said, you know, name five famous doctors. And I think a lot of people can rhyme that off pretty quick, whether they're fictitious or not. And then we asked this question of p folks that were, weren't within the healthcare uh, realm. We said, can you name a famous nurse? Um, and most people said Florence Nightingale. And then when we asked them to name four more, um, most people were really stumped. So what we want to do is we really want the public to understand what nurses actually do and not just to be seen, but also to be heard. I think that the fact that, you know, we, we tend to hear a lot of narratives, particularly in healthcare from physicians, and that's great, but that's just one perspective and we need to bring in other perspectives. So that's why we also want to write the, the, the wisdom of nurses to, to kind of combat inaccurate stereotypes, share our own story talk about the stories of power and balances, health care, our mental health, and of course about the, our main focus, which is patients, because the other piece is we actually want to talk a little bit about health literacy and how patients can empower themselves on this journey as well. Why do you think that we hear more from doctors than nurses historically? Well, there, like you said, if there's actually a historical context where, again, when we look at um, the idea and the imaging be behind nurses, nurses were seen as handmaidens to physicians. We were seen as assistants. We were seen as, you know, these angelic beings that were supposed to be, you know, all-knowing. We don't feel harm. We work very, very hard, and nothing phases us. But that's not true. That's not accurate. And, again, that historical context also brings in that aspect of hierarchy, seeing that, you know, doctors are on top and nurses kind of follow um, behind them. We follow orders. You hear about orders today. It's still actually a part of the, the lingo that we use. But it, that actually doesn't paint a, a proper picture for how better healthcare outcomes can look, how um, working in a hospital should be, because we should be working side by side. We should we, we bring our own knowledge and expertise to the, the profession within healthcare. And I think that's another part we need to do. We have to dispel some of those and break down some of those hierarchical structures because they don't actually improve patient healthcare outcomes. 
And I think one of the things is we need to realize that we all are contributing members of a team and we all have something beneficial can, to contribute as well. Can I ask you to elaborate on what you, you, you sort of floated over something quickly there and I want to stop you for a sec. You, you said, mm-hmm. or, did you say orders? Are you talking about yes. following so, orders? So this language is still pervasive in your, in your, um, in your field of work. Uh, a hundred percent. So, for example, if you are looking at a chart, you'll see that there's an order from a physician. Like we still use this language today, and I don't, I, I don't know if that language will change, but it's all a part of that historical hierarchical um, concept that that we see still playing out today. And I think again, again, we need to shift the zeitgeist. We need to shift the thinking that you know um, nurses do bring value. We do have expertise. We do have wisdom. It looks different from physicians, but it's also complementary. And I think that's how we need to start seeing um, our healthcare system and how we want the public to start seeing our healthcare system because there is value in our our expertise, our opinions, and within our voice. And we, we need to see more nurses have agency and be able to be a part of policy decisions and how the healthcare system looks overall. Um. In the book, you know how big of a of a of a breadth of the industry, pardon me, your, your field of work do you do you cover? Because I understand you start even from from nursing school. Yeah, we it's such an eclectic um, coverage that we actually have where we talk about a range of things. We talk about nursing school, our careers, what it's like to you know work on the, to be a street nurse or to be a travel nurse or nursing on the fly. We talk about you know very specifically. We talk about some stories related to our own experiences. We talk about things that maybe people might not expect. We even have ghost stories in uh, in in this book as well because we really want to pull out a variety of different things. It's really about pulling back the veil, uh, or you know what I would say. Um, we can, we even have a chapter that's called "What Happens on Nights Stays on Nights," kind of a little bit like Fight Club, where we talk about you know those those different things that most people would not understand, but really pulling back a veil and having insider view and what nurses actually do. Um, what is your advice for people who might be thinking about getting into the profession in Canada in 2024? You know, what I would say is I wish I had this advice given to me is to really come into the profession with your eyes wide open. Make sure that you're asking questions, probably speak to a nurse. I think that'd be very beneficial and understand what the landscape currently looks like from a healthcare standpoint, politically, socially, and otherwise. I think it, um, people really need to understand what's happening. There are highs and lows, being completely honest. And I think it's also un- it's also important to understand that nursing is not just about advocating for the patients, but it's about advocating for yourself and the profession as a whole because we do want to see better healthcare outcomes. And lastly, I would say, you know, my advice would be to pick up a copy of The Wisdom of Nurses because <laughs> also that has a, some of that insider view as well. Nice that you slid it in there. I'll allow it. <laughs> uh, Amy Varley, thank you very much. Appreciate having you on. Thank you. Take care. That's Amy Varley, a nurse and co-founder of the original podcast, Gritty Nurse. She has a book out right now. It's called The Wisdom of Nurses, Stories of Grit from the Front Lines. Now, we're going to continue talking about uh, perspectives on our overall healthcare system today, because after 7 o'clock, a man who was in charge of a large healthcare system in the United States is hoping to help improve our system here. We'll talk to him about what worked there. He is a, a guest in Winnipeg. He, his name is Lee Becker. He's a former chief hospital corpsman from the U.S. Navy and Chief of Staff to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And so uh, he uh, oversaw much of that system in the States, and he is speaking, actually, uh, in Winnipeg this week. So he's going to be on our program after 7. Right now, it is uh, in Winnipeg, pretty good driving conditions, 788-3093, so no problems. Straight ahead spring day, and your CBC Winnipeg News is next. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 6.30, we are still on the positive side of zero as we begin Tuesday. We're at one degree in Winnipeg right now, a high today of five, becoming cloudy and getting windy as well this morning. It is Budget Day in Manitoba, and the province's NDP government presents its very first budget. CBC's Bartley Kivas now with what we know about the budget so far. Wab Canoe's government plans to overhaul the way it collects education taxes in 2025. A spokesperson says the province will scrap the 50% provincial property tax rebate next year. It'll also get rid of the $350 property tax credit. In their place will be a flat $1,500 property tax credit. That will offer more benefit for owners of less valuable homes. 
The Canadian press also reported the budget will call for a new electric vehicle rebate, free prescription birth control, double the tax credit for fertility treatments, and a new rebate for security cameras. The province is also expected to extend the gas tax holiday and provide some sort of roadmap for reducing the deficit. Bart Lakivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, a political science professor at the University of Manitoba says the first budget from a new government is usually significant. Christopher Adams expects big changes from the NDP compared to the previous Conservative government, especially related to health care. But Adams doesn't think the government has a lot of financial wiggle room right now. I don't expect a balanced budget, uh, but... You know, the, the Wab Canoe has indicated that, that he is in favor of balanced budgets, but I don't think, I, you know, I don't have inside information, but, but I, I suspect we will not get a balanced budget. But Adams does say the NDP will lay out a plan for balancing future budgets. Winnipegger Jake Giesbrecht wants the government to address climate change in the budget, and that includes getting rid of its gas tax rebate. That is the most important issue by far uh, for me. I drive an electric car. I am being have, having to pay the bill for people who are using gas-operated vehicles because I don't get a benefit out of that. That should, should never have been brought in place in the first place. Giesbrecht also wants health care to be a priority. He says the government has to find better ways to provide care as opposed to just spending more money. We will bring you all the budget details after it is released this afternoon. Seven aid workers with the international humanitarian group World Central Kitchen have been killed while delivering food in Gaza. And one is a Canadian with dual U.S. citizenship, according to the group. In a statement released overnight, World Central Kitchen blamed Israel for the strike, while the Israeli military says it's investigating the tragic incident. The dead aid workers also include citizens of Britain, Poland, and Australia. Australia Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is denouncing the deaths. This is beyond, uh, beyond any reasonable circumstance that someone going about providing aid and humanitarian assistance uh, should lose their life. The source of the airstrike has not been independently confirmed. You can hear the latest on this story as well as other national and international news coming up on World Report at 7. A Winnipeg man who escaped war in Syria as a child is speaking out as conflict rages in other parts of the world. Ibrahim Sarhan was just nine years old when war broke out in his home country. Sarhan is now 20 and says he's grateful to be safe living here in Canada. He has made it his mission to speak out on behalf of war-affected children. To see what's going on in the world right now, to show people how it impacts kids. Uh, as a person who came from there, I experienced it myself, but I know that I'm not alone. There are millions of children who are suffering in war zones. We have more on this story right here on Information Radio. You can also visit our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba, and watch CBC Television News at 6 tonight. Winter's gone, and now the group representing about four dozen snowmobile clubs is reflecting on a tough riding season. Yvonne Rideout at Snowman says sales from trail passes were down about $100,000 this winter. The lack of snow meant many trail systems couldn't stay open. This was a winter of extremes, that's for sure. We were watching areas, what's going to open, what's going to close. Oh my, another trail system is closed. It was a sit-on-the-edge-of-your-seat type winter. I mean, we were victims of Mother Nature in a lot of areas. Not all areas, though, were without snow. The Ashern area was a hot spot as one, uh, one of the only places with solid riding conditions this year. Talk about solid. Cole Perfetti says he was just happy to help the Jets end the slide. Perfetti shot! Cole Perfetti in the third period on TSN, his second goal of the night and the game winner as the Jets edge the Los Angeles Kings 4-3. The win ends Winnipeg's losing skit at 6. Perfetti says he made the most of being on the same line as Kyle Connor and Sean Monaghan. It just felt really good. It was, you know, just really happy that I could contribute and, and help, you know, get back into that. The Jets now are four points behind Colorado for second place in the Central Division. And Winnipeg closes out this homestand Thursday night hosting Calgary.
You can find more news updated throughout the day and the latest on the budget as those details are released today. Just head to cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right, Heather Walls, thank you. You're welcome. Abby Adiemi now with our regional forecast from CBC. Good morning once again. Before we go across the province, let's take off from Winnipeg. It's currently one. With, uh, we're going to be seeing a mix of sun and clouds today, but actually outside is uh, currently with doing a dance with a cloud and some clearing. We should expect some gusts of northwest winds, as mentioned earlier, and we're aiming for a high of five degrees today. Now, tonight the skies will clear up, but we should be expecting some fog patches here and there. So if you're outside the perimeter or in open areas, you might be noticing fog patches uh, during your night's commutes. Heading west to Brandon, it's currently zero on the mainly clear skies. You can anticipate a sunny start with clouds rolling in later with uh, gusty northwest winds also because that's something we should be factoring in for most of uh, the southern part of the province today. For Brandon, we will see a high of uh, 6 degrees. Moving north to Thompson, it's currently minus 3 with cloudy uh, period of snow ending later in the afternoon. That light snow you're seeing will be ending later this evening, this afternoon rather, and then the skies will clear up and temperatures will reach a high of 4 degrees. Uh, further north in Churchill, it's currently minus 8 and cloudy. Expect a mainly sunny day and then the winds will come into a play there. You'll be seeing a high of minus 2 later. Down in Dauphin, it's currently 1 with clear skies. You can expect a mix of sun and clouds today. A chance of flurries later in the morning and the high will reach uh, 6 degrees. Gimli, good morning. You are at minus 1 under a clear sky. Uh, the Interlake region will be seeing a mix of sun and clouds today, then becoming cloudy and also the northwest winds will come into play. High of 4 degrees. In Steinbeck, it's currently minus 1 with partly cloudy skies. Also a mix of sun and clouds in the forecast for today, then becoming cloudy later and a bit of uh, wind will play for uh, will come into play for folks in Steinbeck. High fa- uh, six degrees, and finally in Morris, it's currently minus three degrees. It's partly cloudy. The Pemna Valley region will see increasing cloudiness and gusty northwest winds. Also, temperatures will reach a high of six degrees. All right, thanks, Abby. You're welcome. It's time for an update on the commute, uh, Corey. My favorite part about this time of year is getting my rubber boots, going out there with my shovel, or or I'll actually have like a hoe like a garden hoe. Yep. And then while that water's starting to get, the icy water's starting to get slushy is like pushing it all towards the sewer drain. Oh, it's, it's like my little sound. spring ritual. I know I wish I had some sound of it, but that, and then it's my spring ritual is kind of like literally I'm just like pushing spring along into yeah. the dra- like, and like pushing winter <laughs> away into the drain. It feels good. Yeah, it's my favorite thing. Uh, I think that uh, the other good thing is uh, when conditions are like this, I mean, it's a nice drive. You know, you got to remind myself mm-hmm. not to speed. I'm just going to be full disclosure because <laughs> sometimes I'll be driving along and I'll be like, whoa, you know, and you're getting used to just the dry pavement again. I know, it's wild. Yeah, yeah I know, got to schedule to get those winter tires off. Uh, it's uh, been so far a pretty straightforward commute. If you're on those sidewalks, though, do look out for that little bit of that fresh ice that kind of freezes overnight. Uh, Dan on a bike called. He said it's a beautiful ride for him so far on the rapid transit bike lanes, but there is still some fresh ice that kind of catches him off guard every once in a while, so just be careful. Some slippery patches. Also, Megan uh, catches in here in the newsroom on her drive in says Brandon and Osborne. It's a bit of a slalom between little construction sites right around that uh, that area there, uh, so do look out for that. might cause a uh, slow down your commute a little bit, but if you see anything else going on, give me a call Call on the CBC commuter line, 204-788-3093. All right, thanks, Corey. Thank you. It's time for business news. Crystal Lee Ramlikan is uh, on Zoom with us this morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning, Marcy. So let's start with uh, some insight we're getting into how consumers uh, and businesses are feeling about the economy. What do we know? Well, sentiment actually improved in the first quarter of this year, and that's even despite higher interest rates putting a drag on the economy. So the Bank of Canada just released its business outlook and consumer expectations surveys, and they show increased optimism as people expect interest rate cuts are on the horizon. So although businesses still reported weak demand, the outlook for sales and employment intentions improved after several quarters of decline. And expectations for improved sales are supported by population growth and efforts to enter new markets or develop new products. Now, almost two thirds of consumers are cutting or postponing spending though due to high inflation and interest rates. 
but they are becoming less pessimistic about where the country and the economy is headed. So fewer think they will need to further cut or postpone spending. Now, workers also continue to be optimistic optimistic about the uh, job market and expect strong wage growth. Now, we know that inflation fell to 2.8% in February, and forecasters widely expect the central bank to begin cutting interest rates around the middle of this year. And so, Marcy, we are watching for the next interest rate announcement from the Bank of Canada, which is scheduled for April 10th. To another story, a large Canadian payment technology company has announced now a deal to go private. What do we understand about this story? Yes, so Nuve will be taken private by U.S. private equity firm Advent International in a deal that values the company at $6.3 billion U.S. So less than four years ago, Nuve went public in what was the Toronto Stock Exchange's largest tech IPO ever. And the Montreal-based company has scored an investment with actor Ryan Reynolds, and it has partnerships with Adobe and Microsoft. So the founder and CEO, Philip Thayer, he's going to remain as the company's chair and chief executive, and the leadership team is also sticking around. And this deal comes weeks after Nuve announced it had formed a special committee uh, to evaluate expressions of interest from potential buyers. And since then, the share price has climbed. So a little background here on Advent uh, has made it has made more than 415 private equity investments across more than 40 countries, and it has about 91 billion dollars in assets under management. So Nuve says it's going to benefit from Advent's uh, resources and expertise. Now this deal it still requires shareholder and regulatory approvals, but it is expected to close late this year or in the first quarter of 2025. And finally, before markets here, uh, Crystal Lee, why is Google deleting billions of data browser records? Well, this is part of a settlement for a lawsuit that accused the tech giant of improperly tracking the web browsing habits of users who thought they were searching the internet privately. So this suit was filed in 2020 and it accused Google of misrepresenting the kind of data it collects when people use the incognito mode in Chrome. So Google did agree to settle this suit late last year, but the terms were first disclosed in a filing yesterday. And what we found out was that Google will update its disclosure to inform users about what data it does collect uh, each time a user initiates a private browsing session. For the next five years, Google will also let private browsing users block third-party cookies, and it's no longer going to track people's choices to browse the internet privately. Now, the attorney representing the plaintiffs says this is a historic step in requiring, uh, you know, honesty and accountability from a dominant technology company. But, um, you know, Google says it never associates data with users when they use incognito mode. And, you know, while the plaintiffs originally asked for $5 billion, well, they're not going to receive any damages here, but they may still sue for damages individually in the future. What's going on in the markets today? So in Europe, stocks are higher as major markets return to action after the Easter weekend and investors looked ahead to the start of a new trading quarter. So right now, Germany is just slightly down. The UK and France are both up. In Asia, markets are mixed as investors assess new economic data from South Korea and Australia. Japan is up. Shanghai is down. Hong Kong is up. Oil is up $1.40 to $85.11 US per barrel. Gold is up $20.40 to $2,278 US per ounce. And the dollar is up 0.03 of a cent to 73.72 cents US. And that's business news with Crystal Lee Ramlikan. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. We hear it every morning at this time at 6.45 a.m.
It is mostly cloudy, one degree. I hope you had a great long weekend, maybe a long, long weekend if you were off yesterday. Uh, of course, the uh, kids back in school yesterday already. So Tuesday morning here, uh, mostly cloudy in Winnipeg. It's one degree. We're heading for a high of five. It's going to be windy, though. Winds northwest 30 to 50. Man, oh, man, though, late uh, later this week, uh, we could be into those double-digit daytime highs with lots of sun. So we're looking forward to that. And also just to touch a concern about drought, I was just talking to one of my colleagues here about the fact that we've covered so many floods in Manitoba. Certainly we've had dry years, uh, even one year in my 21-year career here at CBC or 23, whatever it is now. Uh, I've covered drought, but it's not something we cover each and every year. But this year we're going to have to really lean in and pay attention because uh, we just did not get a lot of moisture. Well, it is budget day in this province. Later today, the budget comes down. Up to Speed will be live in the rotunda at the legislature. And tomorrow, we're live out in community, actually at a gym in uh, Waverly West neighborhood in Bridgewater uh, there. The Premier is actually going to be on our show tomorrow. But what will we be hearing this afternoon? Finance Minister Adrian Sala will table the government's first budget later today. That's the NDP since they took office last fall. It's expected to fulfill some of their election campaign promises. Now, for some pre Budget context. So Radio Canada's Corentin Mité Mignon spoke with Christopher Adams, adjunct professor in political studies at the University of Manitoba. You know, it's a change of government. It's not just a, a new fiscal year, but it's, a, it's the first NDP budget since they've been elected last October. So there, there will be a lot of media attention paid to this budget. Uh, the questions raised uh, by many people, is this budget going to be changing the direction that the progressive conservative government had before? And uh, the general sense is, yes, there are priorities that the NDP have, which are different than the uh, Heather Stephenson and, and Brian Pallister governments uh, before. Um, one of the things, Carnton, is, is that people um, are wondering if they've had enough time to do a change of direction. I know Brian Pallister's PCs, when they were elected in 2016, they really uh, did a uh, they really did few changes in their first budget after defeating the NDP. But then the changes came uh, the following year. So um, the question is, in my mind, is that to what extent have the NDP had a time to make the big changes that they want to make? And I think they 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 will be making big changes on Tuesday. Um, so right now, Wab Kinu and his government are still very popular. They're actually the, the yeah. he's actually the most popular premier in uh, in the whole of Canada. Uh, do you think this can change? Well, you know, there's a lot of commentary that the um, the NDP is in a honeymoon phase that they're they're riding high in the polls, and that's just natural that they'll be dropping. You know, after realities settle in, um, I'm not sure if if that's absolutely. Uh, um, uh, for sure, because, you know, if you look at the Gary Doerr government in, in 1999, they're elected and they they uh, had ups and downs, but they did do fairly well in the polls right up until uh, Gary Doerr's departure for uh, becoming the, the ambassador to the United States. So I, I would say that that uh, it shouldn't be assumed that the riding high in the polls will will uh, suddenly dissipate. I do think, though, that that once the PCs have their opposition um, um, strategies and, and their people in place and a new leader later in the year, that things do uh, uh, will likely change somewhat in the polls. But back to the budget, I, I think that there, there are a number of things we're going to be watching for on Tuesday. One is the extent to which the NDP has maneuverability with what they're declaring as a very, very high level of debt and deficit for for the province, close to $2 billion is, is seen as, as is the deficit and um, uh, Adrian Sala, the Minister of Finance, has been signaling that over the past few weeks. Uh, but you know, there will be things such as we'll be watching for, like health care. Uh, that's the big uh, issue over the last election, and and uh, the NDP has made many promises. Other areas for the education taxes, um, uh, they'll. I understand that there likely will be a change in how how uh, education taxes will be rebated back to Manitobans. Um, I expect a lot of things in this budget and, uh, um, and a lot of attention will be paid to this budget because it's the first Wab Canoe uh, budget. Christopher Adams, adjunct professor in political studies at the University of Manitoba, speaking there uh, with Radio Canada's Corentin uh, Mite 
Mignon, and that conversation happened yesterday as we were all uh, working on teeing up the budget. So uh, that is not the only budget that we're talking about. So Manitoba's budget comes down this afternoon, but in more than two weeks, a little more than two weeks, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Krista Freeland are going to deliver the federal budget. In the federal budget, uh, the federal government is promising a renter's bill of rights. So we're going to get some more details on that. We've been asking you what it's like to rent in Manitoba. And ahead of our next uh, interview, I just want to read a couple of quick comments here to set us up. So I asked you what it's like renting in Manitoba and making ends meet. And uh, Mary Jo Welch said, I started eating at the soup kitchen in Brandon after last year's rent increase. I'm looking at being priced out of my apartment of 21 years in another two years due to rent increases. I realize water, sewage and insurance has gone up for management, but for the extra amount they get from each of us, uh, they seem to be still doing well after paying those expenses. So Mary Jo writing in from Brandon. Uh, Viv Ketchum writing in, uh, talking about her EI sickness benefits running out here in Winnipeg, saying my long-term disability application's in limbo and I have 30 days to come up with May's rent. And Liam Brennan finally writing in, is this a joke, this question? Are we expected to say anything other than something horrendous? And we have so many comments uh, from renters. So let's turn our attention to the federal budget. I mentioned a renter's bill of rights is one of the things that is expected to be in that. But what else? The Liberal government will make advance announcements ahead of tabling this. Uh, so it is expected also pharmacare and housing will uh, factor centrally in the budget federally. Sarah Ritchie is here to walk us through some of what we understand so far. Uh, she's a federal political reporter with the Canadian Press. Good morning. Good morning. So what would you say is going to be the general theme of the federal budget? Well, I think the Liberals want this budget to be about affordability and they want it to be about helping the people who need it the most. You know, all of those comments that you just read from from people who are renting, people who are struggling, this is happening across the country and the Liberals know this very well. And they are going to try to reach people, you know, younger people in particular, I think. Uh, they talked a lot about families. They talked a lot about young families and helping people who are renting. I think that their focus is trying to be seen to be there for the people who are really struggling at this point. And like you said, they're out trying to set this up early with a series of announcements, like yesterday's news about a national school food program. Uh, that means bringing the provinces along in a lot of ways, um, you know, and having the provinces work with them on a lot of national programs that are not necessarily federal jurisdiction, but things that they can provide the funding for. Um, on the uh, issue of affordability, what else are you hearing by way of measures? So we know that there will be more to come on pharmacare in this budget, like you mentioned. Uh, we'll expect to see just the costing, the, the funding to actually implement the first phase of pharmacare, which will cover contraceptives and diabetes medications. There have also been announcements about things like funding loans for child care centres. So that's the Liberals trying to actually bolster that $10 a day child care program that they've talked so much about in recent years and which we know is not quite working as well as it should be or as well as it could be just yet. Uh, there's a lot of child care centres that are, you know, struggling to make ends meet and a lot of parents, frankly, who are on waiting lists, um, extremely long waiting lists, depending on where you live. There's also renter protection. So you mentioned that rental bill, uh, renter's bill of rights, which would try to make rental rates more transparent so you could see what previous rates were in a building before you, you sign on, on with a lease and to create standard lease agreements. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. One of the initiatives that they announced last week already and aimed at renters was uh, about making your credit score count when you try to get a mortgage for buying a house. It's not really about renters. It's actually about home ownership, which is something the Liberals have focused on a lot in recent years. Mm. Uh, what are we expecting in terms of building the green economy? I think we'll see a lot more along the lines of what they announced last year. So the kinds of investment incentives and tax credits that will uh, aim to grow the green economy in a way that makes Canada's economy flexible over the next few years. And also, as the finance minister has said, makes Canada a leader in the world as you know others start to look to where can they purchase critical minerals, where can they get the materials that are needed to you know build electric vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's something that the government has talked a lot about. They spent a lot of energy and a lot of time on the green economy in their budget last year. But these are sort of things that don't have an immediate impact on Canadians. And so they've they've ended up talking much more about affordability. And I think that's something that's affected them when it comes to the price on carbon as well, right? Like they've really struggled to explain the carbon price 
in a way that makes it make sense to the average person in this country. The narrative has completely shifted, and, the, and the, I think that's a lot due to the federal conservatives and, and to provincial conservative leaders as well, talking about affordability, whether Canadians can afford this and whether they're better off. And they're not talking about it in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And it, it's, it's sort of the marquee program for this government when it comes to tackling climate change. So I expect that they're going to try to shift the narrative a little bit and, and try to impress upon people how important they feel it is and how important a lot of Canadians think it is to tackle climate change in a meaningful way. Speaking of what other parties are saying, the opposition uh, and, and, uh, and the NDP, what about fiscal prudence? What about the deficit? Yeah, so the, the federal government has talked a lot about fiscal prudence in the last couple of years, uh, but at the same time, they've racked up massive deficits, and we know that that's something they've taken a lot of heat for from the Conservatives, but not so much from the NDP, you know, who, who's willing to work with them as long as they're willing to, uh, you know, implement some of the, the social programs that they feel are really important. So we saw the government last over the last year um, ask its departments to make spending cuts, to cut back on consultancy fees and travel expenses. Um, that's hit certain departments harder than others. And I think we'll hear a lot more from them about how they're trying to uh, avoid fanning the flames of inflation. That's a phrase they like to use a lot um, while supporting the people who need help. But Finance Minister Christian Freeland has already set out, you know, that she wants to set in place some fiscal guardrails. So keeping the debt to GDP ratio within a certain limit and trying to maintain Canada's credit rating, that kind of thing will be really important to them as well. Uh, Sarah, thank you for the conversation. Appreciate it. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Sarah Ritchie, federal political reporter with the Canadian Press. Uh, We reached her this morning in Ottawa. So the federal budget coming out in a few weeks' time, but our budget coming out later today. Let's go to local news headlines in Manitoba with Heather Wells. Well, it is the very first budget for Wab Canoe and his NDP government. Expect plans to overhaul the way the province collects education taxes for 2025. A spokesperson tells CBC the province is going to scrap the 50% provincial property tax rebate next year. The province is also expected to extend the gas tax holiday. We'll have all the budget details for you when it's released this afternoon. A Winnipeg man who escaped war in Syria as a child is speaking out as conflict rages in other parts of the world. Ibrahim Serhan has made it his mission to speak out on behalf of war-affected children. We'll hear more in our next local news at 7.30. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Mostly cloudy, one degree in Winnipeg. The high today is going to be five. Very similar to yesterday. Maybe a little bit cloudier, though, than we had yesterday. And winds will be northwest 30 to 50 this morning before they calm down a little bit. In uh, traffic, in the morning commute should be good out there. And if you're standing at the bus, should be uh, pretty good as well. Uh, 788-3093 if you have any updates that say otherwise. In the next hour of the show... A man who was in charge of a large healthcare system in the United States is hoping to improve our healthcare system, but not just that, the image of those who are trying to improve it. He is speaking uh, in Winnipeg with the Canadian Public Relations Society. He says Veterans Affairs in the States went from getting a lot of negative headlines to becoming one of the most trusted health brands in America. So we're going to hear more uh, from him. His name is Lee Becker. In addition to the next hour of the program, are you overwhelmed by spring cleaning? It's the time when a lot of us think about giving our homes a deep clean, but where do you start? We're going to have a bit of a story about that. And Bartley Kivas is in to talk about the budget. Stay tuned. World Report's next. on the current. Right now we have high since up. It's so hard not to feel a little joyful when it's sunny and we can be outside and start gardening. There is a pleasure in the familiar in gardening. Year after year, the soil can produce the same beautiful plants. But in parts of Canada, climate change means those rhythms are changing. How gardeners are adapting coming up on the current. The Current with Matt Galloway. This morning at 837, 907 in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. World leaders are reacting with outrage to reports seven aid workers have been killed while delivering food in central Gaza. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. This is a human tragedy that should never have occurred. 
that is completely unacceptable. The aid workers were with the group World Central Kitchen. It says they were killed by an Israeli airstrike overnight. A dual Canada-U.S. citizen is among the dead. Israel's military says it is investigating the incident. Anna Cunningham has the latest. World Central Kitchen says the foreign nationals were working in Gaza in the central area of Dar al Bella when their convoy was hit. Images from the scene show the charity's logo clearly visible on a vehicle. This is an organization that's been, you know, working on building a port right on the front lines. Matthew Hollingworth is the World Food Programme Country Director for Palestine. He was in Gaza last week and knew those who died. They were bringing food assistance from that pier that they've built to their warehouses in, in Derabella, and then they were coming back in the evening from that warehouse to their base in Rafa. It's understood that the charity had shared its coordinates with the Israeli military. We have yet another immense tragedy. James Elder is from the UN's Children's Fund, UNICEF. This has been one of the most dangerous places in living memory to operate. Gaza's breaking too many bleak records. The UN has warned that Gaza is on the brink of a man-made famine. World Central Kitchen CEO said this was an unforgivable attack. It's now pausing operations in Gaza, as is a second NGO. They had been supplying some two million meals a week. Anna Cunningham for CBC News, London. Iran is accusing Israel of launching airstrikes at its embassy in Syria yesterday, and it is promising to retaliate. Hussein Akbari is the Iranian ambassador to Syria. He says Israel has violated international law. Seven military commanders were reportedly killed in the attack. This is the first time Iran's embassy compound in Syria has been hit. Israel's military has not commented on this incident. President Joe Biden's military support for Israel could be a factor in the upcoming U.S. election. Both he and Donald Trump are expected to win their respective primary votes tonight in Wisconsin. But some Democrats say they will mark their ballot uninstructed in protest of Biden's continued support for Israel. The CBC's Richard Madden joins me now from Washington. And Richard, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is a movement by younger progressives who are pushing voters to mark uninstructed. That's Wisconsin's version of voting uncommitted on the ballot. It's a way to protest President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Their goal is to register a symbolic 20,000 votes, which is roughly Biden's margin of victory over Donald Trump in this critical swing state in the last election. Now, organizers say they want to send a message to force the president to call for a ceasefire and stop sending weapons to the Israelis. This is an issue that's divided the party and threatens Biden's coalition that helped him win the White House in 2020. Thousands of voters in about a dozen other states have chosen similar options against him, which is raising concerns among Democrats if these voters they typically count on choose to stay at home in November. That could cost Biden the presidency. Now, the Biden campaign issued a statement saying the president shares their goal for an end to the violence, and he's working tirelessly to that end. Now, President Biden is considering a new weapons transfer to Israel. What impact could this have with voters? Yeah, this could further divide his party, especially left-leaning progressive voters. Multiple reports say the Biden administration is about to greenlight an extra $18 billion aid package to Israel. Now, Congress has to approve the deal, which will likely cause more outrage from the progressive wing in his party, who've been calling for restricting military aid to Israel until it lets in more humanitarian aid into Gaza. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. Donald Trump has posted a $175 million bond in his civil fraud case in New York. That means he does not have to pay the full $454 million while he appeals the case. Trump is accused of lying about his assets to secure better loan rates and deals. Police in Finland say a 12-year-old suspect is in custody after a fatal school shooting. They say the child opened fire on an elementary school this morning. One student died. Two others were injured. The victims were also 12 years old. Police say the shooter had a handgun that was registered to a close relative. In Finland, police cannot hold suspects who are younger than 15. The suspected shooter will be handed over to Child Protective Services. 
Former directors from conservative, liberal, and NDP campaigns are scheduled to testify in Ottawa today. They will appear together in a panel at the public inquiry into foreign interference. The CBC's Janice McGregor is following along from our Parliamentary Bureau. And Janice, what will you be listening for this morning? Marcia, an early theme emerging here is whether officials took the threat of foreign interference seriously enough and communicated it clearly enough to those who needed to hear it, like this first panel of witnesses this morning. People who ran the 2021 election campaigns for the Liberal, Conservative and New Democratic parties, Waleed Soliman, the co-chair for the Conservatives, was outspoken about how he does not think this system worked. Intelligence officials didn't share enough specifics about what they knew in specific writings. They only made general statements, he said, about how there wasn't enough evidence to suggest there's anything to worry about. Conservatives themselves, though, were worried, specifically about false information they realized was circulating on Chinese language social media that they now think moved a number of votes in specific writings. But the evidence presented at the inquiry Thursday suggested that Canada's elections watchdog didn't think the application of false information fell under its mandate. The inquiry will also hear from several politicians accused of participating in China-backed meddling efforts this afternoon. What might we hear there? Yes, and these are politicians who have taken legal action, actually, to try and defend their reputations after media reports suggested they had inappropriately close ties to consulate officials acting on behalf of the government in Beijing. Former Provincial Cabinet Minister Michael Chan, who's now the Deputy Mayor of Markham, he featured in a number of media reports quoting secret intelligence sources. And the final two witnesses this afternoon, now independent MP Han Dong, as well as his campaign manager, they're expected to speak directly to the allegations that that operatives meddled in a 2019 Liberal nomination meeting. But as we heard last week at the inquiry, nomination meetings aren't inside the mandate of what election officials monitor. All right. Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. Janice McGregor reporting from Ottawa. Lawyers for the oil giant Shell will be before a Dutch court today. They are appealing a landmark ruling from The Hague. In 2021, the international court ordered Shell to reduce carbon emissions by 45 percent from 2019 levels, and it gave it the deadline of 2030. The ruling also applied to Shell's buyers. And today, Shell is arguing companies cannot be held responsible for their clients' emissions. A verdict is expected later this year. The countdown is on for millions of people planning to watch Monday's solar eclipse. Parts of central and eastern Canada will get some of the best views, as Matthew Kupfer reports. Those locations are attracting a lot of visitors who want the full eclipse experience. This thing was a phantasmal vision that completely changed the course of my life. Canadian eclipse chaser David Makepeace has been following the moon's shadow for three decades. On April 8th, he'll be watching the total eclipse from Mexico. This rare event will be much closer to home for many Canadians. He's encouraging those who live in the path of the partial eclipse to make the drive to where the sun will be completely covered the path of totality. Get as deep into the path of totality as you can. The center line um, along the path of totality is where the eclipse lasts longest. Some parts of southern Ontario are just inside the path of totality. Makepeace says it may be worth crossing the border to New York State, where there are more drivable roads in the area of the path of totality and it's easier to get around the weather. If you're willing to cross the border into the States, it's your shortest drive to the longest amount of totality. Many Eclipse watchers have already made plans. Many will descend on Watertown, New York. So our hotels have been booked up for about a year now. Sarah Campo-Pierce is mayor of Watertown. She says the city is expecting upward of 170,000 visitors for the Eclipse eight times their population. We have been seeing people register from tickets from as far away as South America, Italy, across the country. But you don't have to be part of a crowd to take in this once-in-a-lifetime event. You just need a safe spot wherever you have a clear view of the sky. Matthew Cooper, CBC News, Watertown, New York. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report. I'm Marcia Young. Good morning, Manitoba. Thanks for joining us here on Information Radio on CBC. I'm Marcy Marcusa with our team here at the show. You're on 89.3 FM, 990 AM on the app or on YouTube. 
Well, here we are, second day of April, still waiting for it to really, really warm up by the end of the week. But right now it's mostly cloudy and one degree in Winnipeg. It is budget day in this province. The first budget that the NDP will deliver since being elected in the fall. Many promises were made, but will Manitoba's new NDP government make good on those promises when the numbers come out this afternoon? We'll have a TF of what we can expect from today's provincial budget. By the way, up to speed live in the rotunda at the legislature with their show later today. In addition, are you overwhelmed with spring cleaning? A lot of people think of this time of year to give their home a deep clean, but then it can be really stressful. Where do you start? We're going to get some ideas from a few experts this hour on the show. Right now, let's go to Heather Wells for uh, more news stories and what's making headlines this morning. Good morning. Well, Winnipegger Dante Santangelo says homelessness is the top issue he wants the government to address in today's provincial budget. Santangelo says the government should also focus on reducing wait lists in health care. We'll hear more about what people are saying may be in today's budget coming up as well. And winter's gone, and now the group representing about four dozen snowmobile clubs is reflecting on what was a tough riding season. Snowman says sales from trail passes were down about $100,000 this winter, all because of the lack of snow. We'll hear more in our next local news at 7.30. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, we're hearing from you this morning as well. Call us and let us know what your family needs in this budget. 788-3205. Quick comments coming in on Facebook already. Uh, Kathleen Noel Black, a healthy future for my world, for my children and for theirs. Kathy Harness saying lower food prices. Uh, Mike Chin saying more money. <laughs> that's, the, that's the obvious answer <laughs> for every family, right? Uh, Dilly Ram Sapota writing in, no waiting at the ER for 18 hours. Hours. Danielle Jillian Sullivan writing in less taxes for the middle class were tapped out. And uh, we have Amanda Yaki writing in lower food prices as well, lower wait times at hospitals, and a better equitable formula for money distribution for school boards and funding, and better laws for crimes, uh, for crime rather. So those are some of the comments coming in from you this morning. What does your family need? Budget Day in Manitoba. Give us a call. We'll get your calls on the air. 788-3205. The Premier, by the way, is going to be live on our show tomorrow uh, after we get all those details. Uh, right now, let's turn our attention to the day, to the morning. Abby, Eddie, Emmy's here with our weather. Good morning, Marcy. Still cloudy out there. I know we're trying to, we're looking for that mix of sun and cloud that's going to come later, but uh, the thing you need to put into consideration as you start your day is the winds, the gust of winds coming from the northwest. Uh, outside of that, we're heading to a high of five degrees we'll see clearing skies tonight and then some fog patches will crawl in overnight moving to brandon mainly clear at zero thompson is cloudy at minus three with some light snow churchill is cloudy at minus eight duffin clear one degrees some flurries gimli is at minus one and clear tonight in winnipeg it's going to be heading to we're going to see um, a high of uh, five degrees and it's going to be a beautiful day with uh, some sun and cloud Corey, the commute uh pretty straightforward this morning sidewalks a little bit slippery going to be be a little bit puddly later this uh, this afternoon. Uh, roads, highways seem fairly clear overall. Uh, bike lanes heard from down on a bike. Uh, they're looking pretty good with the odd ice patch here and there on the rapid transit. Brandon and Osborne though heard from Megan Ketchison here in the newsroom that there's some construction going on there and you kind of have to slalom between uh, road work uh, on Bra at Brandon and Osborne in that area there. So do look out for that. If you see anything else going on out there, 204-788-3093. Well, you just heard Manitobans weighing in and hoping for improvements to health care in this NDP budget later today. And that is, of course, the biggest election promise that was made by this government. People continue in this province to face long wait times for many procedures and diagnostics. Our emergency rooms are full of people who need help, so much so that we are hearing of people giving up and leaving before they're even seen by a doctor. Now, with all of this sort of landscape in mind, we're going to zoom out for our next interview. Uh, the Canadian Public Relations Society has invited the former chief of staff of U.S. Veterans Affairs to talk about ideas on how we can improve our health care system based on their experience. He says Veterans Affairs went from getting a lot of negative headlines to becoming one of the most trusted health brands in America, and he thinks that some of what they learned can help here. Lee Becker joins us via Zoom, former chief hospital corpsman in the U.S. Navy and former chief of staff, as I mentioned, to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Good morning to you. 
Good morning, Marcy. Thank you so much for having me. So just so you know, the, our, our Canadian audience and our listeners here can understand, wh- what was the scope of care that you were involved in in the United States? Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, I'm, as you, know, you mentioned, I'm a Navy veteran as well, and I actually had the opportunity to serve with a lot of Canadians. So it's it's a, a really a privilege to, to be here and, and hopefully give back in some way. Uh, so um, as part of my role, um, I was involved with uh, helping with a lot of the um, returning wounded. We did a really good job in saving lives on the battlefield. But as a result, we've increased the number of of um, seriously injured um, veterans. And um, and the VA was under tremendous stress and being able to address the VA in the U.S. was in tr- under tremendous stress to support all these uh, uh, veterans. And as a result, in 2014, it, it really came to a uh, fever pitch where access to care uh, for veterans was, uh, was not sufficient at all. I mean, veterans were waiting for months, even potentially even a year uh, for, for types of care. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that all the systems, all the metrics showed that everything was fine from a uh, bureaucratic perspective, from a government perspective. We were blind, we, the, the, the VA was actually blindsided by um, uh, this access crisis. Uh, and in 2014, it got so bad where um, it's very well documented. It's known as the Phoenix uh, incident, uh, Phoenix in the US. And um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the senior leaders were held accountable as a result but what's interesting is in the root cause and analysis of what happened, I think is really interesting. And there's some learnings there that I think can really um, support um, in Manitoba and broadly as well. So, so I really want to dig into more details of what, what you learn and how you improve. But what are the lessons you're referring to right now that you think could be extrapolated for us here in Manitoba? Yeah, so I think what, what's interesting is in the, in the root cause analysis, what we realize is we really didn't understand truly the needs of our veteran population. And my tech, when we say the veterans population in the U.S., to give um, your audience an understanding of the, the scope and scale, so there's uh, 20 million uh, living veterans, and there's also 45 million um, family members of veterans. So that's the scope and scale. The VA is 172 uh, healthcare systems. Uh, the budget is over $300 billion. So it's a very large, it's actually arguably the largest healthcare system, um, well, in the U.S. and um, in the U.S. So what we found was is that by by not approaching it with a customer experience lens, what I mean by that is, you know, in, in industry, so if you think like Apple, think of your the the you know darling companies that, gosh, you feel like wow, they understand me, they really know me. It's because they really listen to you. They really listen to their to their uh, customers. So what we've done, what we realized is we did not have the ability to truly listen and validate from veterans whether they're getting the services or not. We had the metrics, we we saw the throughput of how many appointments uh, were, were seen, what the timelines were, and although those were doctored, but we never had the ability to truly verify and validate the experience with those, with those veterans. And as a result, VA was in crisis um, there. And the good news is what we did is we applied this uh, methodology of experience management. And as a result, we were able to um, really turn things around. I mean, at one point, trust that VA was for veterans were over about 55%. And now trust in VA healthcare, I mean, you talk about almost eight years later, is at a high of 90% um, across the board. And um, it, it is just a truly remarkable story, but I think it's a lesson there that that other large healthcare systems can really learn from um, and apply into their, uh, into practice. How did you, how did you, get there. So I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a specific question because our government here is talking a lot about needing to understand uh, what's going on in the front lines from the people getting out of the numbers and the bureaucracy, not dissimilar to what you're suggesting. But you say when we applied this, I think, experienced management, uh, can you can you give us like a practical sense of what does that mean? Does that mean managers going to talk to veterans or what did it actually mean to get a proper sense of the issue so you could tackle them? Yes. So I think there's a multiple, there's a multi-level element there. And I think if you break it down to what, when you think about a service or product of, of what you, of anyone, when we, we try to, whether it's going to, uh, you know, get some coffee or whatever it is, there's really three elements that c- comes down to um, it. One is, is it effective? You know, was the care service effective? The second, was it easy? You know, did, was it an easy process? It may be effective, but it may not have been very easy. You have to go through like 10 paper, you know, whole bunch of paperwork and all that. Third, was it was it emotionally resonant? Was it 
Did you feel respected? Did you feel valued? And I think those are, was, you know, we were, we had so many measures and you think about a large healthcare system, there's so many measures, but when you kind of break it down to what people want and what people need, it's those three things. If you could do those three things, it's, it's pretty outstanding. Now the, now the trick is how do you actually measure that across the board? It can't just be a sampling. You can't just say, all right, I'm going to pick, I'm just going to ask this person. I'm going to ask that person. It needs to be across the board. There needs to be a validation. And the reason for it, and this was a, an interesting aha moment for us, what we found was that when we when we start at um, understanding effectiveness, ease, and emotion, and trust, we start actually measuring trust. What we found was that there were uh, cer certain pockets of our cohorts within our veteran community that were not did not we were not meeting their needs. So, for instance, one of the biggest aha moments was Alaska Natives and Native Americans. We were actually the, they had the lowest scores of effectiveness, ease, and emotion around and trust in our system. So therefore that allowed us to get more tactical and actually address. We also found that younger veterans, younger veterans, um, you know, in certain areas were not, we were not addressing their needs and which kind of, I guess would make sense because if you think of a large VA facility, VA um, system that in the U S a lot of it was geared to the Vietnam era, right. And, you know, World War to Korea, Vietnam. Now you have this whole new cohort of veterans another cohort, which was interesting, women veterans, women veterans told us that, you know, they, it was not um, effective and easy as well, and they didn't actually didn't feel emotionally resonant. So we were able to then address those. So when you start on looking at experience and actually validating, so because people, we talk about equity, we talk about equity to health, we talk about, okay, we need to address the social determinants, we talk about all those things. But if we don't actually truly understand and listen at scale in through through the entire operations of healthcare, the entire journey, we will miss, we will not uh, be able to truly understand those needs. You're going to continue I'll, to become I'll, I'll overwhelmed one, by the huge system goal. I'm sorry? Uh, sorry, I was just saying, I was just saying you're going to continue to become overwhelmed by the massive system goal out here instead of zeroing in and going one population at a time. Uh, final thoughts you were going to share? Pardon me, Mr. Becker. No, it's, uh, please, Marcy, I, I think the, what what is, I get excited. I mean, because when I'm hearing, first off, you know, it's incredible. It's a big day. You know, there, there's the budget, and I know there's a lot of promises made from the healthcare perspective. I think the the what I what I come with is is you know, the reason why I'm here, and I appreciate Lindsay and the, the entire team of, and I'm excited about the gala and and all the awards that are going to be given to these um, amazing um, leaders, well deserving. You know, to me, what I think about is I think there's hope. You know, I know, understand that there's a lot of challenges in the healthcare perspective, but there's hope if, if the organizations are willing to look at it a different way, and if they're willing to look at it from an ins instead of an inside out, look at it from an outside in perspective, and how do you bring the people as part of that process? And I'll give an example that I think really kind of threw briefly, me. Briefly, please. Um, yes, briefly. So when we were understanding the experience, the journey of healthcare, one of the key moments is the pharmacy experience. And I'll never forget this, uh, a veteran that was, we were asking the veteran for their experience about pharmacy, post their experience. And what the veteran said to us is that they were gonna hurt themselves and they were not, um, they, they, feel, they felt that they were not okay. As a result, our, the system that we put in place to understand the experience was able to identify that that veteran was in crisis. What we were able to do is we were able to then of course save that veteran's life. But as a result, we put a process in place that anytime any veteran mentioned uh, those that information, whether on a phone call, whether through the website, that they were they were in crisis, we would automatically get that routed. As a result, in six, in over six years, we've had over twenty thousand saves, twenty thousand veterans' lives saved. Again, it's just be by better listening, right? You never know when the issues are are going to come up, but by better listening, you have this apparatus you're able to then arguably not only improve quality safety, but you're able to actually save lives, uh, which is, you know. I we will have to leave our conversation there uh, for this morning. Uh, Mr. Becker, thank you very much for being with us. I know you're speaking Thursday. I'll mention the details and appreciate uh, being with you this morning over Zoom. Thank you so much, Marcy. Thank you. That is uh, Lee Becker. He is uh, a former chief of hos chief hospital corpsman from the U.S. Navy and former chief of staff to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. We've been talking about Thursday. He's speaking at a, an event in Winnipeg, six o'clock at the Qualico Center in Assiniboine Park. If you want to go, you can find tickets on Eventbrite. You can search Lee Becker, and it will be, as he alluded to, also an event where uh, individuals who work in uh, public relations here uh, across Manitoba will be honored for their different work with some uh, awards that will be handed out. Your neighborhood, your community, your country, your world, your news, your news that matters. 
news that belongs to you. Your World Tonight, every night, seven days a week on CBC Radio 1, on demand on the CBC Listen app and everywhere you get your podcasts. 7.25 a.m., mostly cloudy, one degree. The commute's going fine. Let's get to morning sports. Hello, Scott Regeer. Hello there, Marcy. So a shakeup in the Lions seemed to have been just what the Jets needed as they uh, downed L.A. yesterday, huh? Yeah, ahead of yesterday's game, uh, Marcy, head coach Rick Bonus changed up uh, forward lines and defensive pairings, saying after six losses in a row, something needed to be done. Uh, and one of the beneficiaries of the shakeup, Cole Perfetti, uh, the forward had been a healthy scratch more often than not in the past few games, but instead found himself on the new-look second line alongside uh, Sean Monaghan and Kyle Connor, and that move proved Proved uh, to work out pretty well for Perfetti. He found the back of the net twice, including the game winner. And the winger says it felt pretty good to uh, score in his first game in this elevated role. It was huge for my confidence getting put in, a, in that chance and, and then obviously going to the net and, and just banging one early. And it's, is, um, you know, that felt great. Just really happy that I could contribute and, and help, you know, get back into that. Um, you know, I missed that for a little bit. So it just feels really good to, to get back and, and help this team win. And Cole Perfetti, Marcy, was also benefiting from the absence of Tyler Toffoli, who was out with uh, an illness of some sort for the game. Uh, so we'll see if Perfetti stays on uh, the line when the Jets are back in action tomorrow. No, check that. Thursday night hosting the Flames. And by the way, should they win that game on Thursday, it will clinch a playoff spot, which would be awfully nice. Over to baseball, the Blue Jays were the victims of this season's first no-hitter. They were, and they fell victim to a pitcher, Marcy, that unless you follow the game very, very closely, you've probably never heard of before. Ronel Blanco of the Astros gave up a couple of walks to George Springer, but other than that, nada for the Blue Jays last night, uh, which is not bad considering Blanco is making just his eighth ever Major League start. Uh, that said, Toronto's been its own worst enemy to start the season, ranking in the bottom 10 in the Major Leagues in offensive court, uh, categories like batting average and on-base plus slugging percentage. So I, I'm sure that'll be fodder for many a Jays fan to criticize management for not bringing in significant upgrades to an offense that underperformed last year as well. Here's the manager, John Schneider. A no hitter is an outlier, you know what I mean. So I mean, I think that we're we're doing all right with where we hope to be, you know, in, in terms of what the offense is supposed to do. Uh, tonight is just, you know, it's one of those nights. You know, you give credit to a guy to do something really, really hard to accomplish, um, and a loss is still a loss. You know, you move on to uh, to tomorrow. So Schneider calling the no hitter an outlier. Uh, although the reality is, Marcy, they have become more common than ever before in the last couple of decades, uh, partly because pitchers throw harder than any time in history and because so many batters have abandoned hitting for average to pursue home runs. Uh, that's led to uh, more strikeouts in recent seasons than we've seen all time, too. So uh, Toronto batters, they whiff seven times against Blanco, and we'll hope for a better result tonight against one of the best in the business in Houston's Framber Valdez. But the Jays are 2-3. and three. Uh, to start this season, and the toughest bit of their opening road trip against the undefeated Yankees uh, remains. So a bit of a, a yikes start here. Let's finish with a boxer who's doing her part to prevent brain injuries. Yeah, Ottawa's Claire Hafner, who is the fourth-ranked heavyweight in the world at the moment, Marcy, but uh, she's focused uh, just as much on tomorrow as she is today. Hafner is taking part in a groundbreaking study of 900 living athletes on head trauma risks. Boxing is a sport where you volunteer to be punched in the head. So I think there's less sympathy around head trauma. There's not a lot of research into it. To me, information is power. This study can tell me things that actually also help me in the ring and things to work on if I'm prepping for a fight. So it's not just that data which is going to help them do research on like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. It's also things about my physical performance that I find incredibly helpful. So Hafner is 46 years old now, still trying to become the Canadian heavyweight champion, though. And every year, Marcy, she goes to Las Vegas uh, and is tested at a brain clinic. She says she... Uh is terrified, frankly, waiting for those results just because of the prevalence of CTE uh, in athletes. So you can read a feature on her today on our website. All right. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Still ahead, springtime ritual for many people. you got your handy-dandy toothbrush with you to kind of get in there. You just simply rinse it. 
We're going to get some ideas on how to give your home a good, deep clean if you're thinking about it now that we've flipped the calendar and we're into April. Speaking of which, uh, we've got a great springtime drive on our hands so far, except the potholes. 788-3093 if you have any updates for us. Stay uh, stay with us here. Your CBC Winnipeg News is next. This is CBC News. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 7.30, we are feeling like spring. It is 2 degrees, a mild start to Tuesday. Mix of sun and clouds and getting windy this morning as well. Today's high is 5. Manitoba's NDP government presents its first budget today. CBC's Bartley Kivas tells us what we know about the budget so far. Bob Canoe's government plans to overhaul the way it collects education taxes in 2025. A spokesperson says the province will scrap the 50% provincial property tax rebate next year. It'll also get rid of the $350 property tax credit. In their place will be a flat $1,500 property tax credit. That will offer more benefit for owners of less valuable homes. The Canadian press also reported the budget will call for a new electric vehicle rebate, free prescription birth control, double the tax credit for fertility treatments, and a new rebate for security cameras. The province is also expected to extend the gas tax holiday and provide some sort of roadmap for reducing the deficit. Bartley Kivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. And you can hear more from Bartley in the next half hour right here on Information Radio. Now, Winnipegger Dante Santangelo says homelessness is the top issue he wants the government to address in today's budget. I find it very unfair that all the homeless people are stuck out on the streets when the government could be investing their money on better things. They're investing in other things when they could be investing in the homeless. Santangelo says the government should also focus on reducing wait lists in health care. Political analysts say the NDP's first budget since taking power will garner a lot of attention. Christopher Adams is a political science professor at the University of Manitoba. He expects big changes from the NDP compared to the previous Tory government. The question is, will they be reopening those emergency rooms that they promised during the during the last election. The other thing is the um, uh, the provincial tax on gasoline. That's costing Manitoba a lot of money having that vacation from those taxes. And the um, question will be is, is to what extent will that be continued? Adams says the NDP aren't likely to balance this year's budget, but he says they will lay out a plan for the future. We'll have all the budget details for you once it's released this afternoon. We're following breaking news from Gaza overnight. The aid group World Central Kitchen says a dual Canadian U.S. citizen is among seven workers killed during an airstrike. In a statement, the group blames Israel for the strike. The victims also include citizens of Britain, Poland and Australia. The Israeli military says it is conducting a review to understand the circumstances of what it says is this tragic incident. You can hear the latest national and international news coming up on World Report at 8. A Winnipegger who was just a child when war broke out in his home country of Syria is now speaking out on behalf of other war-affected children. Ibrahim Sarhan lost his mother and other family members during a rocket attack. He spent months in hospital recovering from his injuries. Today, Sarhan is 20 and says he is grateful for his new life in Canada. But as he sees conflicts around the world, all he can think of are the millions of other children in impacted by war. And I saw in my eyes uh, how war impacts kids. They're innocent. They got nothing to do with any conflict between any war. This is my message to uh, people who have the power to make decisions to save children. You can hear more on this story on Information Radio this morning. And you can also go to our website and see the story on CBC Television News at 6 tonight. Winter is gone, and now the group representing about four dozen snowmobile clubs reflects on a tough riding season. Yvonne Rideout at Snowman says sales from trail passes were down about $100,000 this winter. The lack of snow meant many trail systems couldn't stay open. This was a winter of extremes, that's for sure. We were watching areas, what's going to open, what's going to close. Oh my, another trail system is closed. It was a sit-on-the-edge-of-your-seat type winter. I mean, we were victims of 
Mother Nature in a lot of areas. Not all areas, though, were left without snow. The Ashern area was a hot spot this winter as one of the only places with solid riding conditions. The Winnipeg Jets finally found the win column last night. Here's a chance! Josh Morrissey in the second period on TSN as the Jets beat the Kings 4-3, ending Winnipeg's six-game losing skid. Coach Rick Bonus calls it a much-needed win. I thought it was a hard-fought game. That's an excellent team over there. They're battling for their for their playoffs positioning as well. So that was a hard-fought game. They were on top of us at times. We were on top of them at times. It was a pretty even game. and uh, uh, But, yeah, it was good to see us. You know, I know we... Uh, we had to keep <laughs> tying it up a little, but uh, there was a lot of fight in our group tonight, for sure. Cole Perfetti had a good night with two goals. Next up, the Jets face the Flames Thursday in Winnipeg's last of its five-game homestand. You can find more news updated throughout the day at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right, thanks, Heather. You're welcome. It's time for the regional forecast at CBC with Abby Adiani. Thank you, Marcy. It's um, currently mild here in the city at uh, two degrees. We're in for a mix of sun and clouds today with gusts in northwest winds. Expect the temperatures to reach a high of five degrees. And tonight we'll see skies will definitely be clear in because of uh, some fog patches that will be rolling in later. And Brandon, it's currently zero degrees on the mainly clear skies. We're anticipating a sunny start and then the clouds will roll in later and Brandon will see a, will reach a high of uh, six degrees. Currently it's, uh, in uh, Thompson, it's uh, chilly at minus three degrees, heading for a high of four degrees. Churchill is currently at minus eight. Eight, it's cloudy. However, some sunny skies would crawl in later. The high for uh, Churchill is at minus two. Darwin, Gimli, uh, Steinbach, Morris all hovering around one degrees and zero right now. The region will experience a mix of sun and clouds, and then it's going to become cloudy later. And some winds will be something to put into uh, consideration as you start your day. We will be seeing a high of uh, five degrees also in that part of the region right now. In Winnipeg, we're expecting a mix of sun and clouds, and we're heading for a high of five degrees. It must feel good having some good news to share, huh? I know, like it's been <laughs> it's been a while. Like, and then I'm looking towards uh, Thursday, and I'm seeing 14. So hey, I'm like, I think let's just hang in there after tomorrow, Wednesday, where we see a high of nine. The rest is going to be double digits all the way, That's 11, 12, 13. And when I see snow in the forecast, I'm like, nope. They're still 14. I'm going to start uh, shoveling the snow from the corners of my yard into the center where the sun beats mm. down to get rid of it faster. Yeah, I, I think that. that's, so, the, that's the best that's the idea. That's I'm, not, I'm not below um, raking snow. I like to rake the snow. Oh, yeah, Spread if you got out. the right rake. Yeah, I not? broke a rake one year like that. <laughs> Snap right off the handle. Yeah. All right, that's Corey uh, here for the commute. Yes, uh, a couple of things to keep an eye out for. Actually, just got a call from Andy on the commuter line. Eastbound North Perimeter, right around Pipeline Road. He was going westbound. And as he was driving by, he saw a big lineup of cars. He didn't quite catch exactly what was causing that lineup of cars, but he says it looked like there's a pretty big traffic backup. Eastbound North Perimeter around Pipeline Road. If you're stuck in that, if you know what's going on, give me a call, of course. Uh, also, Julie called. She said there's emergency vehicles in the right uh, in the westbound road. Uh, right lane on William just before Isabel uh, just a couple of police cars and, fi and, a fire fi and a firefighters are there uh, so just keep left to get around that not causing too big of backups uh, there uh, but otherwise things seem to be going pretty smooth there's some icy patches if you are in the bike line lane says down on a bike so keep an eye out for that if you see something going on give me a call on the CBC commuter line 204-788-3093 thanks Corey thank you well as we've been uh, talking about here the snow is melting the geese are honking and the dust bunnies in your home might be multiplying. With the start of the spring season, a lot of us think about giving our homes a deep clean. But where do you start? CBC Manitoba's community reporter, Shanley Vidal, has a slice of life item next. She went out with videographer Prabjot Lote and got some spring cleaning tips from a couple of experts. Hi. Hi. So are we ready to clean? We're ready. We are. My name is Kim Albig. And I am the owner of Caney Cleaning. For us, spring cleaning is definitely a lot more detailed. You know, pulling out the screens and the windows, getting in the trackings, doing ceiling fans, doing vents, pulling them out in the floors, just all the detailed 
kind of stuff that doesn't get done on a regular cleaning. You're going into the season, let's just give everything a top to bottom clean, a freshness, it, make it beautiful so that for summer you don't have to stress about, oh, did I clean inside my hall closet? Oh, did I get all the baseboards? My name is Brittany Brown. I'm the office manager at k and &E Cleaning. So I feel like it's important to clean those areas because a, that builds up. And the majority of your life is gonna come from your base. So if your base is already being neglected, how are we going to excel in any other parts of our lives, right? So, I mean, the simplest thing of your dwelling, your home, this is where we live, this is where we, we take care of our families. Like, the simplest thing to start making your life, like, any sense of being better is by just cleaning up. And certainly, you know, you have kids, get the, get the kids to grab a, a brush and scrub those boards. Like, it's not hard. Okay, so to start off any cleaning, we always want to fill a clean bucket with hot water. And right now I'm going to use Dawn dish soap. Okay. So when cleaning any light, any light, whether it's a fan or it is a fixture, you're always going to want to make sure your light is off before putting any cloth on it. That is because the light is very hot and it will end up breaking. Typically when it comes to fan blades, I do like to wet wipe them, but first I like to get off all of the excess dust. So we're gonna just simply clean those off every single one of them. So after we get all those blades wiped with our Swiffer, we're then gonna go in and we're gonna wipe them with a cloth to make sure that any excess is off. How often do you typically do this? If it was a regular home that we clean, it would be done typically every month. But in my own house, I should be doing it a lot more than I am. And what I do when it comes to starting with cleaning like window sills like this, so for instance, you can see obviously over the winter, um, there has been quite a bit of buildup of of, you know, like some mold in there and some dirt. So we're gonna just simply wipe that away with our cloths. We're gonna take our toothbrush and we're gonna really get in those edges. Now a toothbrush is something you can use in everything from baseboards to just to bathtubs, to windowsills, to whatever you feel need. But people just don't need to make cleaning as difficult as they may think. And you're just gonna keep scrubbing that up. The only blinds that we would ever take off would be Venetian. People don't normally have Venetian blinds, but if you do, you need to definitely put those in a bathtub. Also looks like a little bit of hair. There is, there's pets in, in this home in particular and in, in a lot of homes. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of buildup on here. Now you can, if you want for maintenance, use your Swiffer, which will like, you know, take off a majority of what you want. But when it comes to our spring deeper cleaning, you're definitely gonna wanna take a cloth. It can be damp, dry. Um, if you do have grease on here, you're gonna want it to be wet. But again, you always are cleaning top to bottom. So here's another thing that I definitely feel gets extremely neglected in any home all the time. And this could certainly be um, a task that can only be done once a year, maybe semi-annually if you have pets. But these are gonna be your floor vents. So these guys do definitely get quite full. So a very easy way to take care of this, plop her in the bucket of water, give her a scrub down. Now while that is soaking, you're gonna take your vacuum and you can just simply, you're gonna wanna vacuum out all of that in there. Now, if you do want to, you can even take your cloth and you can give your little filter in here a nice wipe. So as you can see, it very easily comes clean. Dirt on my cloth clean vent and then we're just going to simply and again this is just a five minute task you can alternate between your rooms every month you've got your handy dandy toothbrush with you to kind of get in there and you just simply rinse it 
We're in the kitchen and that can be the messiest place in some people's homes. So you think of the obvious things like floor and the dishes, but are there spots that people might be missing? Absolutely. Now they say a kitchen is the heart of the home. We spend most of our time in here. So absolutely when we're cleaning, things that we miss all the time, and this is a most common one in a dishwasher, like clean in here. That's where you're going to get your buildup. That's where you're going to get your smells all in here. And all you need is some Comet, a toothbrush. This is taking me three minutes. Just an extra tiny little piece of your weekly kitchen clean. Look, look at how much better that looks. Mold for you. It's really going to eliminate a lot of the odor. When it comes to those ovens that are flat top, how do you go about cleaning them? Because I know sometimes I have things that are really stuck on. The key to this is a razor blade. You can put any soap on here. You can put like a vim, anything, and then just take your razor blade and just get all of that dirt off. But I know a lot of people are intimidated by like, oh, is it gonna scratch it? Is this good? This is the best thing to use. All the food that gets burnt on here, look at that, it all just comes right off. Even for my own personal home, as soon as things are out of order, I have that like, oh, this like it's stressful. And as soon as things are in order, you just right away have that sense of peace. At the end of the day, everything doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to be maintained. And I think that's a really important part of cleaning that people also need to understand. It doesn't need to be perfection, but it needs to be progress. And that's just going to make everything in your life better. So are you inspired or nervous after hearing all that scrubbing? Uh, CBC Manitoba's community reporter Shanley Vidal out capturing that with videographer Prabjot Lote. Spring cleaning tips so you don't get overwhelmed. Doesn't need to be perfect as you just heard from Kim Aldig and Brittany Brown. They work with k &E Cleaning. Commotion with Elamine Abdel Mahmoud. It's time to talk about funflation. Crime story. You got one witness who can't be found. This American Life with Ira Glass. There are signs that read, see something, say something. Radio Lab. What is coming up? What is going wrong, actually? The Sunday Magazine with Pia Chattopadhyay. How does the last 24 plus hours complicate or change things? Telling stories. Sunday night on CBC Radio 1 and on the Listen app. Well, speaking of the Listen app and speaking of listeners, a lot of you are writing to us and we've actually got a number of comments I'm going to go through on a couple of different things right now. Just want to first dip into the fact that now the sun's up. Uh, looks really nice out there, actually. Partly uh, blue sky in downtown Winnipeg. It's two degrees currently. We're going to head for a high of five. Will be windy, though. Winds 30 to 50 from the northwest before we warm up into uh, later this week. And on the drive this morning, if you need us, 788-3093. So the uh, comments that I want to uh, read next. So we're going to get to budget comments in a moment, but uh, the first comment is actually ongoing coverage that we have been uh, having here on the show. We continue to cover the impact on our community about what is happening in the war between Israel and Hamas and the recent UN Security Council call for a ceasefire. So last week we had two interviews on the air and then uh, we started to uh, share emails promising uh, to uh, hear perspectives from uh, all of you and uh, also share calls on the air that have been coming in from, uh, from you. So here's part of another series of emails we received from Penny Jones Square, who wrote to us, quote, I was disturbed but not surprised that only three listener comments heard on March 27th were in agreement with the UN Security Council's vote for an immediate ceasefire and the release of all hostages, despite Marcy Marcuse's welcoming of, quote, all perspectives. Media coverage, Penny writes, of the Hamas-Israel war has been unbalanced since the day after October 7th. The world's sympathy for Israel after learning of the horrific slaughter of 1,400 innocent Israeli civilians and abduction of over 200 others was quickly abandoned. And since October 8th, Penny writes, media focus has shamefully shifted from the initial crime of Hamas to Israel's response. A ceasefire condones Hamas's criminal conduct in the war and ensures it remains in power, continuing to oppress its own people and threaten Israel. Penny's email went on to say it is a well-known fact that Palestinian leaders have rejected every offer of peace and statehood Israel has made. 
Penny writing into Radio 893 at cbc.ca and on the, this or other subjects, anything you hear on the show, you can always write to us there. Or if you'd like your voice on the air, please call us uh, and let us know your perspective, 788-3205. By the way, if you want to hear our initial interviews uh, with two community members, you can find them on the CBC. For breaking news as it happens, stay with CBC News. For the latest updates and what it means for Canadians, stay with CBC News. When the biggest stories break, both at home and around the world, stay with CBC News. So if you stay with us today, you're going to hear a whole lot about the budget. It comes out this afternoon. Up to speed live in the rotunda of the legislature. We asked you this morning, like we do every budget morning in this province, uh, what does your family need out of this document that's going to be coming out? So some quick comments, and then Bartley Kivas is going to run down what we uh, think is going to be in the budget today. Uh, Erica Lauren writing in, my middle class family needs to see this government address manufactured poverty. We need a living wage and humane EIA rates that match. We need not just one, but many safe consumption sites in communities in Winnipeg and across the province. We need our relatives to have places to live in dignity. Andrea Cates writing in to fix the drug problem plaguing the city. WPS, Winnipeg Police Services, tapped out as, our, as is our medical system. If the drug problem was eradicated, it would free up time for the WPS and entire medical system. We need rehab services that people don't need to wait months for, and Andrea writing months in caps. Finally, a couple quick ones. Beth Cernick saying more money to put into all levels of education, and Joe W. Webb writing in lower grocery prices. We cannot afford some items that we used to purchase. So this is the NDP's first budget since winning last October's election. Uh, it is expected to fulfill some of the NDP campaign promises. And expectations are high, but so is the deficit, recently forecast at close to $2 billion. CBC senior reporter Bartley Kivas uh, joins me in studio now to tee up the budget. Good morning. Good morning. So first of all, let's start with tax breaks. A lot of people just wanted more money in their pockets. What are we expecting in the budget today? Yeah, so yeah, you said like, what do we think's in the budget versus what do we know that's in the budget? And this government has... Uh, revealed a lot of what's in the budget ahead of time. They've uh, doled it out to several different media outlets. Um, one of the things that they are talking about doing is getting rid of the way education taxes are are handled, provincial property taxes, that is. And in 2025, they're talking about getting rid of the 50% rebate that the PCs brought in, as well as the $350 tax credit that's been there on the property tax bills, provincial property tax bills for a long time, and replacing that with a $1,500 flat break. Now, what, what that will do effectively is owners of less valuable homes, homes assessed below probably about $350, um, They'll pay no provincial property taxes. They'll still have their municipal taxes on this bill, and a lot of people don't know the difference. Owners of more valuable homes, they will may see their, their taxes go up, and in owners of very valuable properties will be paying a lot more. I mean, if you were getting a $100,000 tax bill for your giant commercial property or a million-dollar bill like for Polar Park Mall, and you're getting $1,500 back, that's that's a lot, a lot less back. But for people who have less money, that'll be uh, more money. There's other tax breaks coming. There is a... Um, there, well, I'm going to get into them. You've got a whole list of things for me. Well, we can stay with taxes partly. You've got your list up on your phone there. So, like, share, share what we're seeing here. Because, as you said, they have they have shared a lot in advance of this afternoon. Okay. There's going to be a $300 rebate, according to the Canadian press, for people who purchase security cameras for their homes and businesses. Uh, there is going to be double the tax credit for fertility treatments and um, free prescription birth control. That's not really a tax break, That's but it, it te technically is. Um, health care. I, I do want to move there. Obviously, it was front and center in the uh, election campaign. What do you think we might hear specifically today on that front? They're going to announce targets for the hiring of additional health care workers. But targets are, you could set aside money for them. But how you actually do that, given the limited pool of health care workers, doctors, nurses, aides, radiologists, everybody, um, every jurisdiction in North America, if not the Western world, if not the planet, is trying to hire more health care workers, given what is happening in terms of that labor market. So um, setting targets is is it's like setting uh, growth predictions for revenue. It, it's something nice to nice to see. There's also going to be we're expecting them to see in the free press is reporting this morning that they are going to be uh, announcing specific plans to reopen um, the Victoria 
uh, hospitals, emergency ward and the women's center there, uh, which were both closed. Those were election promises. So that's one of the two hospitals. But when, where, how much, that remains to be seen. Do we get those details in a budget or we just get the how much? Uh, might we be should, wondering. There, there, there should be a year target. There should be a year target for doing that in the budget. Um, green incentives. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about this since yesterday's Fed carbon tax went up. But what do you think provincially we'll see for green incentives? Well, the electrical electric vehicle rebate, $4,000, that is essentially one of them. Uh, the green disincentive would be the uh, continuation of the uh, gas tax holiday. We'll find out how long that is. Uh, the, the government may turn up their nose at that characterization, but that's the criticism from, from, from the environmental side. Um, specifically, if they have a plan, of, if they actually have a plan to replace the federal carbon tax with a tax of their own, that could be in there. But given the way they've been speaking, uh, I doubt that's fully formed. That said... Who knows? That could be something they've been holding close to their chest and may have explained why they've been so vague about what they wish to be doing or not be doing in place of the federal carbon tax. And the federal NDP did come up with an alternative plan, and we have not heard if the provincial NDP want to follow suit on what that was, but it was also a little thin on detail. The premier, though, when he was here uh, for our last monthly interview, also alluded to another area, which was uh, funding for cities and municipalities, and we were talking about the city of Winnipeg and whether or not there's going to be some changes there. So I'll be watching that. Uh, before you go this morning, I, I wonder um, two more things. I will ask about the deficit in a sec, but I'm wondering it, it, what changes you think we might see that are going to reverse previous PC budget decisions because we had obviously the Conservatives in power for eight years before this. Yeah, I mean, that change to the education tax rebate is a big one. And potentially that, that has the potential for raising a tremendous amount of money for the New, Gre- New Democratic Party and uh, being the largest single revenue generator. That said, I haven't seen a number. So, um, I mean, just back of the napkin sounds like more money comes in than not. They could monkey around with the income tax brackets, but probably not. They're probably going to continue with that. Um, but they, they, they could be making changes, as some of the political observers have noted. Those are the big ones. So what about the deficit before you go? Okay, so deficit projected financial state the province is in, but they've been in government now for six months, uh, or nearly they've been elected for six months, rather, as of tomorrow. Um, the question is governments, as, as the political scientists tend to note, that they tend to want to announce at least a plan to ratchet down the deficit to and get it towards balance. They've promised to do this over one term, but they have these expensive spending promises. So uh, how exactly what we'll be looking for is what are their growth projections? Are their growth projections higher than what the, uh, the banks and the analysts expect growth to be? Because if they're not, well... If if their own growth projections are higher, then it looks like this is it's going to be very very difficult um, for them to to ratchet things down. What cuts will they actually make? Will they actually be cutting back on some areas of healthcare, which is the most expensive line item in the budget? If you consider it one line item, these are questions we'll have to wait to see. A lot of math coming later. Thank you, Bartley. You're more than welcome. That is a Bartley Kiva senior reporter with CBC Manitoba. Bartley and Provincial Affairs reporter uh, Ian Fraze are going to be reporting, be reporting live as soon as the budget is tabled and once we can uh, go live with all the details. And for updates, remember through the day, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Up to speed, starting at 3 o'clock when host Faith Fundell comes on the air, is live this afternoon from the rotunda at the legislature. So uh, all the budget coverage you need right here on CBC. With headlines, here's Heather Wells. Winnipegger Jake Giesbrecht wants the province to address climate change in today's budget. That includes, he says, getting rid of the gas tax rebate. Giesbrecht says he drives an electric car and doesn't benefit from the gas tax holiday. He also wants health care to be a priority. A Winnipeg man who escaped war in Syria as a child is speaking out as the conflict rages in other parts of the world. Ibrahim Sarhan has made it his mission to speak out on behalf of war-affected children. We'll hear more in our next local news at 8.30. And a feature interview with him, Ibrahim Sarhan, coming up right here on the show after 8 o'clock, so please stay with us. It's an incredible story and uh, quite a message he has to share, so stay with us. Two degrees in Winnipeg, seeing just a little bit of light blue sky out there. We're heading for a high of five. Today on Q. What is this place? You're looking pretty good in there. 
I'm Talia Schlanger sitting in for Tom Power. The new film Love Lies Bleeding has been rightfully described as an erotic thriller on steroids. I'll talk to one of the stars, Katie O'Brien, about how her real life experience as a bodybuilder informed her role Jackie. Q, this morning at 10, 1030 in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. The CBC News is next. Coming up in half an hour, it's The Current with Matt Galloway. There is a pleasure in the familiar in gardening. Year after year, the soil can produce the same beautiful plants. But in parts of Canada, climate change means those rhythms are changing. How gardeners are adapting, coming up on The Current. This Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. Leaders from around the world are demanding answers after seven aid workers were killed in an airstrike in Gaza. We we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says Israel must ensure aid workers can do their job safely. Aid workers with World Central Kitchen were delivering food when their convoy was hit. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is vowing to investigate. He says this happens in war and his government will do everything it can to make sure it does not happen again. Among those killed, a dual Canadian U.S. citizen, as well as an Australian, British, Polish and Palestinian workers. Anna Cunningham has the latest. World Central Kitchen says the foreign nationals were working in Gaza in the central area of Dar al Bella when their convoy was hit. Images from the scene show the charity's logo clearly visible on a vehicle. This is an organization that's been, you know, working on building a port right on the front lines. Matthew Hollingworth is the World Food Programme Country Director for Palestine. He was in Gaza last week and knew those who died. They were bringing food assistance from that pier that they've built to their warehouses in, in Darabella and then they were coming back in the evening from that warehouse to their base in Rafa. It's understood that the charity had shared its coordinates with the Israeli military. We have yet another immense tragedy. James Elder is from the UN's Children's Fund, UNICEF. This has been one of the most dangerous places in living memory to operate. Gaza's breaking too many bleak records. The UN has warned that Gaza is on the brink of a man-made famine. World Central Kitchen CEO said this was an unforgivable attack. It's now pausing operations in Gaza, as is a second NGO. They had been supplying some two million meals a week. Anna Cunningham for CBC News, London. Iran is accusing Israel of launching airstrikes at its embassy in Syria yesterday, and it is promising to retaliate. <laughs> Hossein Akbari is the Iranian ambassador to Syria. He says Israel has violated international law. Seven military commanders were reportedly killed in the attack. This is the first time Iran's embassy compound in Syria has been hit. Israel's military has not commented on this incident. President Joe Biden's military support for Israel could be a factor in the upcoming U.S. election. Both he and Donald Trump are expected to win their respective primary votes tonight in Wisconsin. But some Democrats say they will mark their ballot uninstructed in protest of Biden's continued support for Israel. The CBC's Richard Madden joins me now from Washington. And Richard, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, this is a movement by younger progressives who are pushing voters to mark uninstructed. That's Wisconsin's version of voting uncommitted on the ballot. It's a way to protest President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Their goal is to register a symbolic 20,000 votes, which is roughly Biden's margin of victory over Donald Trump in this critical swing state in the last election. Now, organizers say they want to send a message to force the president to call for a ceasefire and stop sending weapons to the Israelis. This is an issue that's divided the party and threatens Biden's coalition that helped him win the White House in 2020. Thousands of voters in about a dozen other states have chosen similar options against him, which is raising concerns among Democrats if these voters they typically count on choose to stay at home in November. That could cost Biden the presidency. Now, the Biden campaign issued a statement saying the president shares their goal for an end to the violence, and he's working tirelessly to that end. Now, President Biden is considering a new weapons transfer to Israel. What impact could this have with voters? 
Yeah, this could further divide his party, especially left-leaning progressive voters. Multiple reports say the Biden administration is about to greenlight an extra $18 billion aid package to Israel. Now, Congress has to approve the deal, which will likely cause more outrage from the progressive wing in his party, who've been calling for restricting military aid to Israel until it lets in more humanitarian aid into Gaza. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. Police in Finland say a 12-year-old suspect is in custody after a fatal school shooting. They say the child opened fire on an elementary school this morning. One student died. Two others were injured. The victims were also 12 years old. Police say the shooter had a, a handgun that was registered to a close relative. In Finland, police cannot hold suspects who are younger than 15. The suspected shooter will be handed over to Child Protective Services. Former directors from conservative, liberal and NDP campaigns are scheduled to testify in Ottawa today. They'll appear together in a panel at the public inquiry into foreign interference. The CBC's Janice McGregor is following along from our parliamentary bureau. And Janice, what will you be listening for this morning? Marcia, an early theme emerging here is whether officials took the threat of foreign interference seriously enough and communicated it clearly enough to those who needed to hear it, like this first panel of witnesses this morning. People who ran the 2021 election campaigns for the Liberal, Conservative and New Democratic parties, Waleed Soliman, the co-chair for the Conservatives, was outspoken about how he does not think this system worked. Intelligence officials didn't share enough specifics about what they knew in specific writings. They only made general statements, he said, about how there wasn't enough evidence to suggest there's anything to worry about. Conservatives themselves, though, were worried, specifically about false information they realized was circulating on Chinese language social media that they now think moved a number of votes in specific writings. But the evidence presented at the inquiry Thursday suggested that Canada's elections watchdog didn't think the application of false information fell under its mandate. The inquiry will also hear from several politicians accused of participating in China-backed meddling efforts this afternoon. What might we hear there? Yes, and these are politicians who have taken legal action, actually, to try and defend their reputations after media reports suggested they had inappropriately close ties to consulate officials acting on behalf of the government in Beijing. Former Provincial Cabinet Minister Michael Chan, who's now the Deputy Mayor of Markham, he featured in a number of media reports quoting secret intelligence sources. And the final two witnesses this afternoon, now independent MP Han Dong, as well as his campaign manager, they're expected to speak directly to the allegations that operatives meddled in a 2019 Liberal nomination meeting. But as we heard last week at the inquiry, nomination meetings aren't inside the mandate of what election officials monitor. All right. Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. Janice McGregor reporting from Ottawa. Lawyers for the oil giant Shell will be before a Dutch court today. They are appealing a landmark ruling from The Hague. In 2021, the International Court ordered Shell to reduce carbon emissions by 45 percent from 2019 levels, and it gave it the deadline of 2030. The ruling also applied to Shell's buyers, and today Shell is arguing companies cannot be held responsible for their clients' emissions. A verdict is expected later this year. Better weather conditions are expected in the coming days off the coast of Vancouver Island. Rescuers are working there to free an orphaned calf. The orca needs high tides to get to the open ocean. As Belpuri reports, getting the whale free is only the first challenge facing rescuers. In a lagoon along the northwest tip of Vancouver Island, a young whale circles and circles again. Ihasset First Nation chief Simon John says the whale has been named Quisaheus, brave little hunter. It is nature, but the community is really affected by it uh, spiritually. It's been nine days since the whale's mother died in the lagoon. The calf can't seem to escape. Paul Cottrell is with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. That's really important that we're monitoring not only the calf, but also it, the calf's pod and the sub that are family relations. BC Whale Research Group Bay Cytology says its artificial intelligence technology has already helped find those relatives. CEO Jared Tower says AI was used to match photos of orcas in the area to pictures in an existing database. We immediately received a, a data submission of 
Kawisa Hayes's extended family, including her grandmother, her aunts and uncles. Whale watching tour operator Lynette Dawson Sommerfeld submitted the photos to the system, alerting rescuers to the pod's direction of travel. They were going to try and get some acoustics or some of the noises that the pod is making that could possibly assist with getting the calf out of the lagoon. To do that, the calf will have to swim over a sandbar and under a causeway. The tides, it's hoped, will be more favourable this week. Belle Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report News Anytime at cbcnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. Good morning, Manitoba. I'm Marcy Marcusa. We find ourselves here on April 2nd, and sky's mostly blue in the downtown. We're heading for a high of 5 degrees. We are live downtown in Winnipeg on 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or YouTube. Good morning, everybody. It is budget day. This half hour, more of your comments coming in on what your family is looking for and needs in this uh, first budget from the NDP government since they were elected last fall. So we'll get into some of that. Also, we have a feature interview this half hour. A Syrian Winnipegger, Ibrahim Sarhan, was a child when he survived a violent rocket attack. Today, he is sharing his story, he says, to advocate for other children of war in conflicts around the world. Stay tuned. He'll share his story. Uh, I spoke with him at length yesterday. He was here in studio, and you'll hear that. Right now, let's go to Heather Wells for headlines. <laughs> Good morning. Well, it is budget day in Manitoba, and the very first budget for Wab Canoe and his NDP government. Expect plans to overhaul the way the province collects education taxes in 2025. A spokesperson telling CBC the province will scrap the 50% provincial property tax rebate next year. The province is also expected to extend the gas tax holiday. Now, Winnipegger Dante Santangelo says homelessness is the top issue he wants the government to address in today's budget. He says the government should also focus on reducing wait lists in health care. We'll hear more Manitoba News coming up at 8.30. All right. Thank you very much, Heather. You're welcome. Let's uh, go to Abby Adeyemi, who is smiling ear to ear, and it's because uh, of the big forecast, oh, right? Good, good morning once again, Marcy. Just looking at uh, the forecast we have for today and the rest of the week. A mix of sun and clouds here in Winnipeg. Then it's going to be cloudier later as the morning progresses. And then we'll get the gusty winds. We're reaching for a high of a five today. Tonight, it's going to be clear. Then we see some fog patches, though the wind from the east is still going to be something we need to talk about. But then it's going to ease off. And tomorrow, we're going to see more sun and we'll head to high of a nine. Looking at uh, Brandon, Dauphin, Steinbach, Maurice, all going to be seeing a mix of sun and clouds today. Temperatures will be hovering around uh, the high of uh, six degrees. Thompson is seeing light. Snow currently, uh, it's at a uh uh, it's going to be clearing later and then we'll get a high of a four. And for Wednesday in Winnipeg, a mix of sun and cloud, as mentioned, high of nine degrees. Thursday, we're going to say high of 12. And Friday, we're going to say a high of 14. Woo! We're already looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm just looking forward to a future forecast. Yeah. The next three days will be wonderful. Today, though, five... That's mm -hmm. it. All right, let's get to the commute, Corey. Yeah, so far, uh, fairly smooth commute, but there's a couple things to keep an eye out for. I got a call from Christy, who says, Northbound Henderson, just before Martin, there was a multi-vehicle collision uh, that was blocking the curb and center lane. And then as you just drive a little bit further north, actually, then there's uh, there's a blocked median lane. So you kind of got to thread the needle a little bit there, not causing too many backups right now. Uh, also heard from uh, Peter that Northbound Archibald, there's some barricades uh, that have been up that are blocking northbound Archibald, but it's kind of down. Then you kind of have to uh, go into the southbound lanes, which is obviously you're, you're supposed to. It's due to construction. So it's just one lane both ways, essentially. And then that's causing uh, it to be a little bit slower on Archibald as well. As well, last thing, northbound, uh, eastbound north perimeter. There's been some big backups. Uh, heard from Andy, who was driving westbound and saw it happening. So there may be an issue there. He couldn't see exactly what, but just heads up, maybe a little bit slower, eastbound north perimeter around Pipeline Road. If you see anything else going on, give me a call on the CBC commuter line, 204-788-3093.
Well, as you've been hearing in part of the news this morning, Ibrahim Sarhan was just nine years old when war broke out in his home country of Syria. Now, from that moment on, his, as he describes it, idyllic childhood was over. Today, Ibrahim is 20 and says he's grateful to be alive and safe in Canada. He lives here in Winnipeg. But with conflicts taking place all around the world, he is thinking about other war-affected children. And that is why he's made it his mission to share his story, and he says speak out on their behalf. I spoke at length with Ibrahim Sarhan yesterday. Thank you. Um, so your childhood in Damascus, um, what, what was it like? Um, idyllic was your word. So before war broke out. What was your life like? Yeah, we were like I was an innocent child. I like to play with my cousins. You know, we went to school early and uh, it was a pretty quiet life. We lived in a village. We are like a uh, uh, small village farmers, you know, like everybody knows everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was a very quiet life for me uh, and for my family. Yeah. All I wanted is to do my homework and show my mom that I got good marks. Yeah. You, uh, when war broke out as a child, um, how did you view it at first? I, I really didn't have an idea about war, you know, like what, what is exactly war? Who is the conflict between, you know? And uh, so when it, when it first broke out, you know, we didn't go to school. We had like a lot of day offs because like it was dangerous. And uh, uh, in my mind, like as a little child, I was like, yeah, like I don't have school today, you know? And, um, you know, but eventually we had to evacuate from our village. And that's where I felt like this is uh, this is bad. And like, I really wanted to go back uh, to my home because we left our house and we thought we will be we will be back like in a couple of weeks. But we, we never went back. Where did you go? My uh, mom's family had a, had a farm and they had like a little farmhouse. It was like a like a, a town uh, close to our village. There's a day of, of, um, of the pivotal rocket attack in your life, what we'll talk about. Before that, when does fear start to creep in? We were at the, still at the village, and we had rockets coming in, and we heard people saying, oh, the tanks are coming to the village. And that's where I, I saw, every, like, I was playing outside my house, and that's how, when I, like, rushed to go to my house to see where my family is, and uh, we just had to run. So when I saw everybody running away, just getting in any car you see, I, I, I literally felt scared. The day of the rocket attack, it was a Saturday? It was a Saturday morning, yes. It was a quiet morning. Uh, so we were playing with my cousins because uh, at, the, at the farmhouse, uh, it was our family and my aunt's family who were there, plus my grandmother. Uh, so we were uh, just playing, you know, like we just had breakfast. My dad and my older brother just, uh, you know, like they went outside. And also my uncles. Uh, so we, the, the only people who stayed in the farm were like children and, and my mom and aunt and my grandmother. What do you remember of your mom doing that day? Yeah, so that, that day my mom was uh, doing laundry and my, my aunt was cleaning the farmhouse. And that's where uh, the helicopter first came. And uh, we heard some like gunshots, you know, like we started rushing into the farmhouse and my mom was calling me. I didn't want to I didn't want to get into the farmhouse because it was like crowded, like 15 kid in, at that house you know I eventually had to get in and but I was like I was at the just exit door you know so you were right at the exit door and then yeah. other people were already in the main yeah room. like there's people in the middle around the walls you know and uh, there's children everywhere you know my cousins my 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 two brothers and one sister were they how old were your uh, so I had a family members? I had a I had a, an older brother he was like two years older than me so he was like 11 at that time and I had a younger brother who was uh, uh, six years old and my sister was still a baby she was uh, around six months, yep. seven months old. So you're all in there. Yes, and my cousins like ages are from seventeen to uh, to five years old. You know? What do you remember about now? You've run in. You obviously saw helicopter gunshots. You're in there. Is it dark? Does it? Can you smell smoke in the air? Like, what was it like in the moments before you don't remember things? So, um, just minutes, like uh, moments before the rocket hit our, our farm, uh, I saw everybody praying. Right. Like my mom, the kids, like, you know, asking God for help. So I like at that moment, I was a kid and I laughed. I, I really did. And my brother, like he pushed me. Don't laugh. Like we are in serious condition. Like uh, it's really dangerous now. So I was like really acting funny. And my mom told my brother, don't don't touch him, you know. <laughs> so everyone was quiet. When I when we heard the rockets coming, there was like f- like uh, five rockets going, you know, like uh, one by one. What does a rocket sound like? Uh, you know, when it's when it's coming towards you, you don't hear it. Like we, mm-hmm. we heard the first few ones, and it's just a, like a whistle. 
and, and like every every everything shakes, you know? The house shakes if it's close to you. So that was happening until we got, you know, the last rocket which hit our farm, and that's when everything went dark. What's the last thing you remember seeing before it went dark? I saw my uh, mom, you know, with uh, my little sister. Do you remember the next thing you saw when you, you know, opened your eyes after the rocket attack? Yeah, so um, I opened my eyes, but I just saw, like, clear sky. And I opened my eyes, I couldn't move any part of my body. Like, not even my hands, just my eyeballs. Like, uh, then I was, like, actually away from the farmhouse. Like, I was, like, two meters away. And, 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 and I started, like, passing out and then, like, coming back to life, passing out. Until I remember uh, somebody holding me, you know, like, running with me. That's what I remember. My hands hanging away from my body. And, uh, yeah, I just saw blood coming out of my hand. And that's where I was uh, put in a, in a, in a, in a taxi. Uh, just to go to, to rush to the hospital, and uh, yeah, in that taxi, I was. It was me and my cousin who was uh, who who passed away, uh, and my little uh, cousin. What had happened to your leg? Yes, so it was it was all like um, fragments all over my body. It was literally everywhere: my head, my two shoulders, uh, my chest. You know, both of my legs. There's this incredible st- moment in your story that I want to share with listeners because you actually found a video that was hours after the attack, you went to click on this video thinking it was maybe another child that had been hurt and it was you. Can you tell me how this happened? Exactly. It was a crazy moment. Uh, I was like, it was like a couple of years after, like, uh, I was in Jordan. I, I was just browsing into videos from my village, like when we were protesting, you know. One of the videos said, oh, a child, you know, like an injured child in the name of the village that I was in. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I really remember my shirt. I was wearing a green shirt, a green pant, and then when I clicked on the video, uh, at first I, I like freaked out because uh, like I didn't I didn't recognize my face because it was all covered with you know like dirt and it was like uh, you know like from the from the rocket it was like black everywhere, and so that was like it was a crazy moment because I couldn't believe and I was really scared like it brought a, brought a, like uh, back a lot of memories and you were in hospital it was yeah when you saw this online yes like. I was I was nine I was nine it was a very difficult like moment to see that video like my heart start, started racing when did you find out uh, what had happened with your other family members that day or so, to your other family members even after I woke up I couldn't talk it was hard for me to talk you know like I I tried to shout like hey but I couldn't. I, I got transported into another hospital where I saw my grandmother and my aunt. And I wondered, like, where is my mom? Where is my, like, two brothers and my sister? And I really got scared. Uh, but I, I just believed them. They told me, oh, they're getting treated at another hospital. Until one day, like, that was three months after the, 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 the story. Actually, a friend of my dad, he told him my condolences in front of me. And that's where I freaked out. Like, I got a feeling, you know, when you get a feeling like that, goes to, like from from your feet to your to the top of your head because you hadn't seen your mom or your siblings in For these months while. you've been told that they're recovering somewhere else yes. now a friend you overhear saying to your dad my condolences yes that's exactly the moment where i uh i knew that somebody died i was shocked like i didn't talk for an hour my other uncle who came in uh he told me listen a lot of people died in this incident i am like who like where is like mom i i all i care is mom and now he first he first started with my cousins, you know, to make it easy on me. He said, "Okay, your cousins died, also your mom and your 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 brother, your two, your two brothers and sister." And that's where the like the big shock. It was a very big shock for me. Like at that moment, I didn't I didn't like cry for an hour. How do you process? That? Yeah, I didn't like. Yeah, it took me a while, but I was a little child. Like remember, yeah. though this this news like affected me when I grew up. You know, that moment I was a little child. I did not know. Uh, what death was, you know, and how, how, like, how people deal with it. And I even asked my bigger brother, like, a, a funny question. I told him, who's my mom now? Like, he, and he, you know, he, like, he didn't know what to answer. He told me, oh, it's, it's your aunt. You can call her mom. What are your uh, impacts of your uh, injuries today? So I, I, I went, I did a lot, a lot of surgeries here and in Jordan. Like, till the moment we're speaking now, six surgeries in Canada. My right leg was, was like, greatly impacted. Uh, they actually saved it here. It was, it was, I got the option to, you know, let it go. But uh, me and my dad, you know, like we told the doctor, like we crossed oceans to come here just to save my leg because I don't want to lose like more. Yeah. You're using your voice today, um, as we said at the beginning. Do you want people to hear your story and think about other children today? Exactly. So 
what made me want to share my story is really what is happening around the world. You know, like uh, first when I saw things uh, happening in Ukraine, you know, I saw a little, like a few stories of children and what happened in Gaza, you know. I, I, I really like to see children's story. And believe me, when I see them, I feel re like related, you know, like because I, I, I know how, how it will impact them. I know how it will, uh, you know, get their future changed. And uh, I want everyone to know that any country, any leader that can, you know, get the children out of those conflicts, it would be really appreciated because it really impacts children forever. Not for a day or two, but forever. I hate war and how it affects children, how it breaks out families. Even though I came to Canada, it's a dream to come to Canada, yeah? But, uh, but I, I, a lot of moments I sat with myself, I said, what if I was here with my family? It would have been really different. I would have been really happy. But I'm here like just me and my dad. It feels lonely sometimes, you know, uh, especially the first few years. And I always, I always wished like, what if we came here in a different circumstances? You know, it's, it's, it's also, it takes courage to be strong and to share a story. I know there's a lot of people who, who've been in wars when they were children, but they don't like to talk about it because it really hurts them, you know. But I, I had the courage to come and share my story. We're grateful, uh, Ibrahim, that you uh, chose to share it with CBC. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Ibrahim uh, Sarhan, a Syrian refugee, now lives in Winnipeg. He's 20 years old now, talking about what happened to him uh, at the age of nine. You can read more of his story in his own words. You can also see the video we alluded to that was him as a child, and he clicked on it, didn't know at first it was him. Uh, all of that's on our website in the piece uh, that uh, he shared with us. So cbc.ca slash Manitoba, and you can watch more on CBC Television News at 6. Well, I want to take just a moment uh, to let you know that we are live uh, when it comes to the Manitoba budget. So up to speed, CBC Manitoba live this afternoon. Faith Fundell is going to be at the legislature for that show between 3 and 6 o'clock. So that's in the rotunda. And then tomorrow we're out in community live. Uh, going to get some reaction to what you think of what we hear in the budget and uh, what uh, is good about it, what's missing in it, all of that. So we're going to be live out in uh, Waverly West tomorrow. Specifically, we will be at... Altia Active Fitness Center in Winnipeg. That's at 100 South Town Road in Bridgewater. So that's out in the uh, Waverly West neighborhoods, the bigger part of the neighborhood, and then you make it smaller. And there's, of course, all the sub sub neighborhoods there. So we're at Altia Fitness Center, Winnipeg, uh, tomorrow. So our show's going to be live on location. So when people are uh, coming in and out of the gym and getting on and off treadmills, we'll get their thoughts on uh, on the budget. Uh, so if you want to uh, weigh in anytime, 788-3205. Well, a bit of music just ahead of the news here. This is a song called Kiam, which means let it be in Cree.
Kiam, Let It Be in Cree. That is uh, from Phyllis Sinclair. Her new album of the same name, by the way, is out now. You're listening to CBC, and your local CBC Winnipeg News is next. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg at 830. It's partly cloudy, two degrees right now. Feels like spring out there this morning. We're going to see a mix of sun and clouds today. Bit of a wind developing later this morning and a high today of five. It is Budget Day in Manitoba and the very first budget for Wab Canoe and his government. Expect to hear about plans to overhaul the way the province collects education taxes in 2025. A spokesperson tells CBC the province will scrap the 50% provincial property tax rebate next year. Canadian Press reports the budget will call for a new electric vehicle rebate. The province is also expected to extend the gas tax holiday. We will bring you all the budget details as soon as the document is tabled in the Manitoba legislature this afternoon. Now, Winnipegger Jake Giesbrecht wants the government to address climate change in this budget, and that includes, he says, getting rid of the gas tax rebate. That is the most important issue by far uh, for me. I drive an electric car. I am being have, having to pay the bill for people who are using gas-operated vehicles because I don't get a benefit out of that. That should, should never have been brought in place in the first place. Giesbrecht also wants health care to be a priority. He says the government has to find better ways to provide care as opposed to just spending more money. Now, another Winnipegger, Dante Santangelo, says homelessness is the top issue he wants the government to address in this budget. I find it very unfair that all the homeless people are stuck out on the streets when the government could be investing their money on better things. They're investing in other things when they could be investing in the homeless. Santangelo agrees the government should also focus on reducing wait lists in health care. Political analysts say this NDP first budget since taking power will gain a lot of attention. Christopher Adams is a political science professor at the University of Manitoba. He expects big changes from the NDP compared to the previous Tory government. The question is, will they be reopening those emergency rooms that they promised during the during the last election. The other thing is the, um, uh, the provincial tax on gasoline. That's costing Manitoba a lot of money having that vacation from those taxes. And the um, question will be is, is to what extent will that be continued? Adam says the NDP are not likely to balance this year's budget, but he says they will lay out a plan for the future. In other news, a Canadian-American citizen is among seven aid workers who were killed by an apparent Israeli airstrike in Gaza. The food aid group World Central Kitchen says the workers who died were in the process of delivering food that had arrived by sea yesterday when they were struck. As a result, the charity founded by celebrity chef Jose Andres says it has suspended operations in the region. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu acknowledges the country's forces carried out what he describes as an unintended strike. A Winnipeg man who escaped war in Syria as a child is speaking out as conflict rages in other parts of the world. Ibrahim Sarhan was just nine when war broke out in his home country. He is now 20 and says he's grateful to be safe and living here in Canada. Sarhan says he has made it his mission to speak out on behalf of war-affected children to see what's going on in the world right now, to show people how it impacts kids. Uh, as a person who came from there, I experienced it myself, but I know that I'm not alone. There are millions of children who are suffering in war zones. For more on his story, all you have to do is head to our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. You can also watch CBC Television News at 6 tonight. Well, winter is over, and for many who love to ride snowmobile trails, it was a tough season. But one part of Manitoba did not suffer from a lack of snow. CBC reporter Bryce Hoy traveled to the West Interlake. Just giving her on the trails. Nothing quite like it, according to Clayton Gibson. Everything about snowmobiling, the camaraderie, the uh, friendship, meeting new people. Gibson is economic development officer for the RM of West Interlake. He says snowmobilers from across southern Manitoba descended on the trails around Ashern this winter because it was blessed with more snow. Our trails were the busiest they've ever been. 
Jay Rahutsky is president of the Ashran Snowmobile Club. Every cabin that you stop at, there's 20 sons there, sometimes more. That was good for Ashran's economy. Hotels booked up, restaurants busy. But poor riding conditions meant other communities lost out on the white gold rush. Many trail systems couldn't stay open this winter, and revenue from the sale of trail passes was way down. But the snowmobile tourism boom has Gibson already brainstorming ways to draw riders back again next winter. Bryce Hoy, CBC News, Asher in Manitoba. And that is the CBC News from Winnipeg. As always, you can find more news updated throughout the day, including all the budget details when it's released this afternoon. Just head to cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right, thanks, Heather. You're welcome. So up to speed once again, live in the rotunda at the ledge this afternoon for the show for the budget. And I just want to mention before we look at last weather and traffic, uh, some folks in Dauphin might be bleary-eyed this morning because in the MJHL, one of the longest games in that league's history, Dauphin uh, went on to uh, the Kings went on to beat the blizzard. Guess how many overtime periods, Abby? Bring it on. Eight periods of hockey in Whoa. total, five overtime periods. Last night. The final pictures, are sticks are in the air, but there's no one in the stands. So it was really late. Uh, congrats uh, to them. They uh, move on in their series. So last look at the uh, f- commute first, Corey. Uh, yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing uh, too much to report. Look out if you're on the north perimeter uh, going eastbound uh, near Pipeline. There may be some backups there. Abby? A mix of sun and cloud and gusty winds. It's what's in the menu for today. And the regions are going to be seeing more of uh, uh, mixing sun and cloud hovering around the high of six degrees. Thompson is seeing light snow, which is ending now, heading to a high of four. And Churchill is mainly sunny, heading to a high of minus two. Thank you, Abby Adiemi. You're welcome. Corey Funk, Brad Lillies, Heather Wells, Megan Ketchison, Joni Niccolo, our live team here this morning. Thanks to our hardworking associate producers and our leaders in units. Leif Larson, Nelly Gonzalez, and producer Wendy Parker. Thank you all. Take care. Be well. We'll be back with more analysis of the budget all day long.